Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's interview with Hilary Graves will be a blast to people who like philosophy, economics, or global priorities research. It's going to be especially useful to people who might want to do their own research into effective altruism at some point in the future. So before that, I just wanted to flag a few opportunities at Hillary's Global Priorities Institute, or GPI, that listeners might want to know about. If that's not of interest to you, you can skip ahead about two minutes to get to the actual interview. GPI aims to conduct and promote world-class foundational research on how to most effectively do good, with the goal of creating a world in which global priorities are set using evidence and reason. To that end, GPI just started looking for a head of research operations who will report directly to Hillary and be responsible for all aspects of GPI's operations, including strategy, communications, finance, and fundraising. They're looking for someone with an analytic mindset, a demonstrated track record of independently managing complex projects, and the ability to communicate and coordinate with others. There'll be a four-year contract, the job pays 40 to 49,000 pounds a year, and people can apply from anywhere in the world. Applications close on the 19th of November, so you'll want to get onto applying for that fairly soon. They also have a summer research visitor program and are looking for economists working on their PhD or early in their career who want to come visit the Institute in summer 2019. Applications for that close 30th of November. Both of those opportunities are advertised on their website and of course we'll link to them from the show notes and the blog post. Pretty soon, GPI will also start advertising a series of postdoctoral fellowships and senior fellowships for both philosophers and economists, which will start next September. In the meantime, they're keen to explore the possibility of research positions with interested and qualified researchers. If you're a researcher in philosophy or economics who either already works on GPI's research themes or is interested in transitioning into research in those areas, and you might be interested in working at or visiting GPI, then do send a cover letter and a CV to contact at globalprioritiesinstitute.org. The above applies to everyone from master's students through to emeritus professors. All right, on with the show. Here's Hilary. Today, I'm speaking with Hilary Graves. Hilary is a philosophy professor at the University of Oxford and director at the Global Priorities Institute there. Besides issues in effective altruism and global priorities, her research interests include foundational issues in consequentialism, the debate between consequentialists and contractualists, issues of interpersonal aggregation, moral psychology and selective debunking arguments, the interface between ethics and economics, and formal epistemology. It's quite a lot to talk about there. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Hilary. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. So uh, I hope to talk later about how people can potentially advance their careers in global priorities research and perhaps even work at uh, the Global Priorities Institute uh, itself. But first, uh, what are you working on at the moment and, and why do you think it's really important? Okay, so I've got three papers in the pipeline at the moment, all motivated more or less by effective altruist type concerns. So one concerns moral uncertainty. This is the issue of what's the right structural approach to making decisions when you're uncertain about which normative claims are correct, or if you're in any other sense torn between different normative views. And there I'm exploring a non-standard approach that goes by the name of the parliamentary model, which is supposed to be an alternative to the standard expected value kind of way of thinking about how to deal with uncertainty. A second thing I'm doing is trying to make as rigorous and precise as possible the common effective altruist line of thought that claims that insofar as you're concerned with the long run impact of your actions rather than just say their impact within the next few years, you should be directing your efforts towards extinction risk mitigation rather than any one of the other countless causes that you could be directing them towards instead. And then the third thing I'm doing is more a matter of methodology for cost-benefit analysis. So economists routinely use tools from cost-benefit analysis to make public policy recommendations. Typically, they do this by measuring how much a given change to the status quo would matter to each person measured in monetary terms and then adding up those amounts of money across people. Mm -hmm. Philosophers typically think that um, you shouldn't just add up monetary amounts, you should first weight those monetary amounts according to how valuable money is to the person and then sum up the resulting weighted amounts across persons. And there's a lively debate between philosophers and foundationally minded economists on the one hand and lots of other economists, I should say, including lots of foundationally minded economists on the other hand, about whether or not one should apply these weights. So there's a bunch of arguments in that space that I'm currently trying to get a lot clearer on. Right. So, uh, yeah, we'll come back to a bunch of those issues later. But I noticed when uh, doing, doing some preparatory research for this episode uh, that it seemed like you'd had a major shift in what you were focusing on in your research. You, you started out mostly in philosophy of physics, uh, and now you're almost entirely doing kind of, kind of moral philosophy. 
yeah, what, what caused you to, to make that shift and what were you looking at to begin with? So, yeah, I originally did an undergraduate degree in physics and philosophy, and that's how I got into philosophy. So I kind of, by default, ended up getting sucked into the philosophy of physics because that was at the center of my undergrad degree. And I did that for a while, including my PhD. But I think it was always clear to me that the questions that had got me interested in philosophy more fundamentally, rather than just like as part of my degree, were the questions that I faced in everyday practical life. You know, what were the reasons for acting this way and that? How much sense did this rationale somebody was giving for some policy actually make? And then eventually, after working in research for a few years, I felt that I was just sort of ticking the boxes of having an academic career by carrying on writing the next research article in philosophy of physics that spun off from my previous ones. And that really wasn't the thing I wanted to do. I felt it was time now to go back to what had originally been my impetus for caring about philosophy and start thinking about things that were more related to sort of principles of human action. Yeah, what, what exactly kind of uh, philosophy of physics were you doing? So in philosophy of physics, most of my research centered on the interpretation of quantum mechanics, where... Uh, there are really confusing issues around how to think about what happens when a quantum measurement event occurs. So if you have some electron with some property and you want to measure this property, um, standard quantum mechanics will say that the system that you're measuring proceeds according to one set of rules when nobody's carrying out a measurement. But then when the experimental physicist comes along and makes a measurement, something totally different happens. Some new rule of physics kicks in that only applies when measurements are occurred and doesn't apply at any other time. And on a conceptual level, this, of course, makes precisely no sense because we know that measurements are just another class of physical interaction between two systems. So they have to obey the same laws of physics as every other physical process. So foundationalists of physics and philosophers of physics for a long time had tried to think about what the kind of grand unifying theory could be that described quantum measurements without giving special status to measurements. One of the most prominent so-called interpretations of quantum mechanics is a many worlds theory, according to which when a measurement occurs, the world splits into multiple branches. And for complicated reasons, this ends up being a story that makes sense without giving any fundamental status to the notion of measurement. It doesn't sound like it does the way I put it, um, but honest, it does. So I got interested in this many worlds theory, and then I was working for quite a while on issues about how to make sense of probability within a many worlds theory, because probability is normally thought of as being absolutely central to quantum mechanics. But at first glance, it looks as though the notion of probability won't any longer make sense if you go for a many worlds version of that theory. Uh, yeah. How, how do you rescue probability? Is it a matter of like there's there's more worlds of one kind than another? Yeah, kind of. That's what it ends up boiling down to, at least according to me. So, I mean, the, the basic prima facie problem is if you say, OK, I'm going to do this quantum measurement and the world is going to split. So possible outcome A is going to happen on one branch of the universe and possible outcome B is going to happen on the second branch of the universe. Then, of course, it looks like you can no longer say the probability of outcome A happening is a half, like you used to want to say, because look, you just told me the probability of outcome A happening is one, just like the probability of outcome B happening. They're both going to happen, yeah. definitely, on some branch or other of the universe. So yeah, so many of us ended up thinking the right way to think about this is maybe to take a step back and ask what we wanted from the notion or what we needed from the notion of probability in quantum mechanics mm. in the first place. And I convinced myself, at least, that we didn't in any particularly fundamental sense need that the chance of outcome A happening was a half. What we really needed was for it to be rational to assign weight one half to um, what would follow from action, from outcome A happening, and it be rational to assign weight one half to what would follow if and where outcome B happened. So if you have some, some measure over the set of here actual future branches of the universe, and in a specifiable sense, the outcome A branches total measure one half and the outcome B total, the outcome B branches total measure one half. Um, then we ended up arguing, you've got everything you need from probability. This measure is, is enough, provided it plugs into decision theory in the right way. Yeah. Uh, how controversial is this multiverse in interpretation? It depends what community your question is relativized to. Yeah. I think among physicists... It's rather uncontroversial amongst physicists who thought about the question at all, but possibly not for very good reasons. The thing that physicists get from many worlds quantum mechanics that they don't get from any of the other things that are on the menu as options for sort of foundationally coherent interpretation of quantum mechanics is that you don't have to change 
the existing equations of physics if you go for a many worlds interpretation. If you go for the other alternatives, so a so-called pilot wave theory or a dynamical collapse interpretation, you're actually changing the physics in measurable ways. So if, you, if you've been through physics undergrad and you've been through physics grad school and you've built a career based on working with the existing equations of physics, then you've got an obvious reason to kind of like it yeah. if you've got a coherent foundational story that's consistent with all that stuff. So there's that kind of maybe not epistemically very weighty reason mm. for physicists to prefer the many worlds interpretation. And a lot of them are very happy to, to go along with that. If you're instead asking about philosophers of physics, then it's much more controversial and very much a minority view. All oh, right. What, what's kind of the argument for, for not thinking it's a, it's a multiverse? Well, one of them is that probability doesn't make sense. But uh, like we <laughs> but said, it also doesn't seem very virtuous. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're asking the wrong person maybe okay, for a yeah, sympathetic exposition of why people think this is a bad theory. Does, does it and seem... also, I've been somewhat out of this field for the last 10 years. So, right, yeah. you know, back when I was working on this stuff, probability was one of the main bones of contention. Mm. I ended up kind of feeling that I and my co-researchers had solved that problem and moved on. But then I stopped listening to the to the rest of the debate. <laughs> so I don't know how many, how many people are now convinced by that stuff. Yeah. Do, do, do you feel like it's kind of an open and shut case from your point of view? Or... Like, so set, well, setting aside the fact that, of course, you know, uh, other smart people disagree, so you've got to take, take their view seriously. If, if it was just your perspective, uh, would it be pretty clear that it's, it's multiverse? So the statement that I am willing to make confidently in this area is I don't think that considerations of probability generate any difficulty whatsoever for the multiverse theory. Yeah. There's some other stuff that I think is more subtle and actually, to my mind, more interesting about um, exactly what's the status of the branching structure and how it's defined in the first place. I ultimately think that's probably not problematic either, but I think there are a lot of things there that could be helpfully spelled out more clearly than they usually are. And I think the probability stuff is, yes, an open and shut case. So it sounds like you've made a pretty major switch in, in, in your research focus. Uh, how, how hard is that and how uncommon is that in academia? Good question. Yeah, it's quite uncommon and the career incentives quite clearly explain why it would be uncommon because academia very much rewards lots of publications, lots of high quality publications. Mm -hmm. And if you've already got a research career going in one area, it's always quite easy to generate another equally high quality paper following on the line of research that you're already embarked on. Whereas mm -hmm. if you switch to a totally different area, as I did, and as many others have done, there's a pretty long fallow period where you're basically reduced to the status of a first year graduate student again. And when people ask you, what are you working on? Your answer is no longer oh, I've got three papers that are about to be published on X, Y, and Z, and it's more, oh, I'm not really working on anything as such right now. I'm just kind of looking around, learning some new things. So I had a like quite embarrassing period of maybe two or three years where I would try and avoid like the plague situations where people would ask me what I was working on because I felt like the only answer I had available was not appropriate to my level of seniority since I was already tenured. You know? <laughs> so in, in that sense, it's kind of tricky. But I think if it's something that you really want to do and if you're willing to bear with that fallow period and if in addition you're confident or maybe arrogant enough to have this kind of brazen belief that your success is not localized to one area of academia, you're just a smart enough person that you'll be successful at whatever you take on. So this is not a risk. It's just a matter of time. Um, then it's definitely something that that you can do. And I'd encourage more people to do it because at the end of the day, if you're not working on the things that you're excited about or the things that you think are important, then you, you might as well not be in academia. There are lots of other more valuable things you could do elsewhere. Yeah. I, did you deliberately wait until we had tenure to, to make the switch? And would you recommend that other people do that? In my case, it was, honestly, it was not deliberate. <laughs> and because of that, I feel it'd be a bit inappropriate for me to try and advise people who don't yet have tenure that they should do a similar thing because it definitely slows down your publication record for a good few years. Yeah. Uh, and, and that just like puts you at risk of not, not being able to stay in. Yeah. I mean, there's a kind of halfway house you could go for where you keep up your existing line of research but you devote some significant proportion of your time to side projects. That's a model that I've seen lots of graduate students successfully pursue. Hmm. Um, and I think that's probably good, even from a purely careerist perspective. You know, you end up much more well-rounded. You end up knowing about more things, having a wider network of contacts and so forth than if you just had your narrow main research area and nothing else. Yeah. Do you think you learned any other lessons that would be relevant to people who want to switch into doing global priorities research, but, but aren't currently in it? 
maybe depends what other thing they are currently in. I did find that some of the other areas of research, some of the particular other areas of research that I happen to have worked in previously involve learning stuff that usefully transferred into doing global priorities research, like um, my work in both philosophy of physics and formal epistemology had given me a pretty thorough grounding in decision theory mm. that's been really useful for working gl global priorities research. And at a more abstract level, having worked in physics meant that I was coming into global priorities research with a much stronger mathematics background than a philosopher typically might have. Mm. And one thing that's meant is that it's been much easier for me to dive into interdisciplinary work with economists mm. than some other philosophers might find it. But these reasons are quite is idiosyncratic to the particular things I did before. Yeah. I'd expect that you'd always find particular things from your other area of research that were useful. They'd just be different things, obviously, if you had a different previous background area. So yeah, what, what is uh, formal epistemology? So formal epistemology in practice more or less lines up with a Bayesian way of thinking about belief formation, where instead of thinking in terms of all out believe, like I believe that it's raining or I believe that it's not raining, you talk instead about degrees of belief. So this is most natural in the ca in the case of things like weather forecasts, where it's very natural to think in probabilistic terms. You know, if it's if the question is not whether it's raining now, but whether it will rain tomorrow, weather forecasters typically won't say it will rain tomorrow or it won't rain tomorrow. Mm -hmm. They say the chance of it raining tomorrow is thirty percent or whatever. So in Bayesian terms, you would report your degree of belief that it will rain tomorrow as being 0.3 in that kind of context. And so then formal epistemology is concerned with the rules that govern what these numbers should be and how they should evolve over time. Like if you get a new piece of information, how should your degree of belief numbers change over time? So the work I did in formal epistemology was mostly on a bunch of structural questions about how these degrees of belief should be organized and how you justify the normative principles that most people think are correct about how they should be organized. So isn't it just Bayes theorem? Like what are the, I guess there's challenges choosing, choosing priors, but um, yeah, well, what, are, what, are the, what are the open questions in formal epistemology? Okay, so Bayes theorem itself is just a sort of trivial bit of algebra. Yeah. The non-trivial thing in the vicinity is the principle of conditionalization, which says that, you know, here's the right way to update your degrees of belief when you get a new bit of evidence. You move from whatever your old credence function was to the one that you get by conditionalizing on the new bit of evidence. And we can write down the mathematical formula that says exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. So there's widespread agreement that at least in normal cases, that is in fact the rational way to update your degrees of belief. There's much less agreement about precisely why it's the rational way to update your degrees of belief. So yeah, we all get the sense that if somebody updates in a completely different way, they're weird, they're irrational, there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Um, but instead of just slinging mud, we'd like to have something concrete to say about why they're irrational or what's wrong with them. So some of the early work I did in formal epistemology was exploring that question. And I tried to provide, well, I guess I did provide a decision theoretic argument based on the idea of expected utility. But importantly, expected epistemic utility rather than expected practical utility. We could say a bit more about that difference in a minute for why conditionalization is the uniquely rational updating rule. Basically, the idea was, OK, if what you're trying to do is end up with degrees of belief that are as accurate as possible, they conform to the facts as closely as possible. But, you know, you're proceeding under conditions of uncertainty, so you can't guarantee that you're degrees of belief are going to end up accurate. If you take a standard decision theoretic approach to dealing with this uncertainty where you're trying to maximize expected value, but here it's expected value in the sense of expected closeness to the, to the truth, a co-author and I were able to prove that conditionalization is the updating rule for you. Any other updating rule will perform worse than conditionalization in expected epistemic value terms. Interesting. Okay. So Normally, you have decision theory that's trying to like maximize expected value where you might think about some like moral value or like prudential value, like getting the things you want. But here you've redefined the goal as maximizing some kind of epistemic expected value, which is like having beliefs that are or credences that are like in, in correspondence with the world as much as possible. Or whereas like your, your, right. your, your errors are, are minimized. That's right. Yeah. So just to be clear, the claim is not that this should be your goal. That you should okay. live your life in such a way as to yeah. maximize the degree of fit between your beliefs and the truth. That would be a crazy principle. The thought was more, actually, what we have in play here are two different notions of rationality. Mm. There's something like practical or prudential rationality. Uh, which is the way we normally think about maximizing value. You just decide what the stuff is that you care about and you try to maximize the expected quantity of that thing. Yeah. That's the normal notion of rationality. But 
on reflection, it seems that we also have a second notion of rationality, which you might call epistemic rationality, mm. uh, which is about having your beliefs respond to the evidence in the in the intuitively correct kind of ways. Yeah. And we wanted to work out what are the principles of this epistemic rationality thing, even when doing what's epistemically rational might in fact conflict with doing what's practically rational. Mm, okay. Uh, well, we'll stick up a link to that to that paper. It's like a, a, epistemic decision theory, right? No, that paper is the 2006 one, Conditionalization Maximizes Expected Epistemic Utility. Ah, okay. And then the later paper on epistemic decision theory, is that just uh, more of the same kind of thing? Or is that a different different argument? It's different. It's related. But so there the issue was, when we think about practical decision theory... There are some cute puzzle cases where it's not obvious precisely what notion of expected utility we ought to be trying to maximize. So for the cognoscenti here, I'm talking about things like the Newcomb problem, where there's one action that would cause the world to get better, but would provide evidence that the world is already bad. Mm. And there, people's intuitions go different ways on whether it's rational to do this action. Like, do you want to do the thing that gives you evidence that you're in a good world? Or do you want to do the thing that makes the world better, even if it makes it better from a really bad starting point? So this this debate had already been reasonably well mapped out in the context of practical decision theory. And what I do in the epistemic decision theory paper is explore the analogous issues for the notion of epistemic rationality. So I'm asking questions like, okay, we know that we can have causal and evidential decision theory in the practical domain. Let's write down what causal and evidential decision theory would look like in the epistemic domain. And let's ask the question of which of them, if either, maps onto our intuitive notion of epistemic rationality. Mm. And the kind of depressing conclusion that I get to in the paper is that none of the decision theories we've developed for the practical domain seem to have the property that the analog of that one performs very well in the epistemic domain. I say this is a kind of depressing conclusion because it seems like in order to be thinking of epistemic rationality in terms of trying to get to good epistemic states, like trying to get to closeness to the truth or something like that, you have to have a decision theory corresponding to the notion of epistemic rationality. Mm. So if you can't find any decision theory that seems to correspond to the notion of epistemic rationality, that seems to suggest that our notion of epistemic rationality is not a consequentialist type notion. It's not about trying to get to good states in any sense of good states. Huh. And I at least found that quite an un unpalatable conclusion. Yeah, so uh, just just um, uh, for, for the people who haven't really heard about decision theory, could, could you explain like what are kind of the archetypal problems here that, that make it an interesting philosophical issue? Sure, okay. So there's a like, well-known in the field problem called the Newcomb problem, which pulls apart two kinds of decision theory, which in normal decision situations would yield the same predictions as one another about what you should do. So normally you don't have to choose between these two different things, and normally you don't realise that there are two different decision theories maybe at the back of your mind. But I mean, here, here's the Newcomb problem, and hopefully this will help people to see why there's a, a choice to be made. So suppose you find yourself in the following admittedly very unusual situation. You're confronted with two boxes on the table in front of you. One of these boxes is made of glass, it's transparent, you can see what's in it, and the other one is opaque. So you can see that the transparent box contains a thousand pounds. What you know about the opaque box is that either it's empty, it's got no money in it at all, or otherwise it contains a million pounds. And for some reason you're being offered the following decision, you either take just the opaque box, so you get either nothing or the, or the million pounds in that case, and you don't know which, or you take both boxes, so you get whatever's in the opaque box, if anything, and in addition the thousand pounds from the transparent box. But there's a catch, and the catch concerns what you know about how it was decided whether to put anything in the opaque box. The mechanism for that was as follows. There's an extremely smart person who's a very reliable predictor of your decisions, and this person yesterday predicted whether you were going to decide to take both boxes or only the opaque box. And if this predictor predicted you'd take both boxes, then she put nothing in the opaque box. Whereas if she predicted that you would take only the opaque box, then she put a million pounds in that box. OK, so knowing that stuff about how the predictor decided what, if anything, to put in the opaque box. Now, what do we think about whether you should take both boxes or only the opaque one? And on reflection, you're likely to feel yourself pulled in two directions. The first direction says, well, look, this stuff about whether there's anything in the opaque box or not, that's already settled. That's in the past. There's nothing I can do about it now. So I'm going to get either nothing or the million pounds from that box anyway. 
And if in addition I take the transparent box, then I'm going to get a thousand pounds extra either way. So clearly I should take both boxes because whether I'm in the good state or the bad state, I'm going to get a thousand pounds extra if I take both boxes. So that's one intuition. But the other intuition we can't help having is, well, hang on, you told me this predictor was extremely reliable. So if I take both boxes, it's overwhelmingly likely the predictor would have predicted that I'll take both boxes. So it's overwhelmingly likely then that the opaque box is empty. And so it's overwhelmingly likely that I'll end up with just a thousand pounds. Whereas if I take only the opaque box, then there's an overwhelming probability the predictor would have predicted that. So there's an overwhelming probability in that case that I'll end up with a million pounds. So, you know, surely I should do the action that's overwhelmingly likely to give me a million pounds, not the one that's overwhelmingly likely to give me a thousand pounds. So corresponding to those two intuitions, we have two different types of decision theory, one that captures the first intuition and one that captures the second. Um, so the, the decision theory that says you should take both boxes is called causal decision theory because it's concerned with what your actions causally bring about. Um, your actions, in this case, if you take both boxes, that causally brings about that you get more money than you otherwise would have. Whereas if you say you should only take the one box, then you're following evidential decision theory because you're choosing the action that is evidence for the world already being set up in a way that's more to your favor. Yeah. So what what, what do you make of this? Well, I'm a causal decision theorist, Hmm. and most people who've thought about this problem a lot, I think it's fair to say a causal decision theorist, but that's by no means a universal thing. This problem remains controversial. So my kind of like amateurish attitude to this is like, well, causal decision theory seems like the right fundamental decision theory, but in particular circumstances, you might want to pre-commit yourself to follow a different decision theory on causal grounds. Uh, Because like you'll get a higher award if you follow that kind of process. Does that sound plausible? It's definitely plausible. I mean, pre-committing to follow decision theory X is not the same action as doing the thing that's recommended by decision theory X at some later time. So it's completely desist- it's completely consistent to say that, you know, in, like in the Nukem problem, for example, if I knew that tomorrow I was going to face a Nukem situation and I could pre-commit now to Take one following evidential decision theory henceforth, mm. and if in addition the predictor in this story is going to make their decision about what to put in the box after now, then definitely on causal decision theory grounds, it's rational for me to pre-commit to to evidential decision theory that that's that's completely consistent yeah so, so i find i find all this a little bit uh confusing um uh, but i I, I guess i don't quite understand um what people still find interesting here but but i guess if, if you're programming an ai maybe this like comes up a lot because you're trying to figure out what should you pre-commit to like what kind of like odd situations like this might arise the most mm-hmm. Such that, uh, like, maybe you, maybe you should program an agent to deviate from causal decision theory, or seemingly deviate from causal decision theory, in order to get like higher, higher rewards. Yeah, yeah, that seems right. I mean, I think the the benefit that you get from having been through this thought process, if you're theorizing in the AI space, is that you get these insights, like that it's crucial to distinguish between the act of following a decision theory and the act of pre-committing to follow that decision theory in future. If you've got that conceptual toolbox that pulls apart all these things, then you can see what the crucial questions are and what the possible answers to them are. I think that that's the value of, of having this decision theoretic background. Yeah. There are a few other cases that I find um, more more amusing or maybe more compelling because they don't seem to involve some kind of uh, re- reverse like causation or back, backwards, like, uh, yeah, back, backwards causation in time. Um, oh, can, wait, hang on. Can I interrupt that? Oh, oh, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. no back... There's no backwards causation in this story. That's important. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm quite good at predicting your actions, for example. Like, I know you're going to drink coffee within the next 10 minutes. There's nothing yeah. sci-fi about being able to predict people's decisions. And by the way, you're probably now in a pretty good position to predict that I would two box if I face the Nukem problem tomorrow. Yeah. You are very smart, but you didn't have to be very smart to be in a position to make that prediction. Hmm. Yeah. So there's nothing. Like People often feel the Nukem, the Nukem problem involves some, something massively science fictional, but it's really quite mundane, actually. It's unusual. Yeah, um, but it doesn't involve any special powers. Yeah, I, okay. So I agree with that. Like on, on paper, it doesn't involve any uh, yeah backwards causation. But I guess I feel like it's 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 messing with our intuitions because you have this sense that like your choice of which boxes to pick is going to like cause like somehow like backwards in time cause them to have have put a different amount uh, a different amount of money in the in the box. Uh, so I feel like that's that's part of why. It seems so difficult is because it's like it's kind of building into it this intuition that you're causing like that, you, that like you can affect like today like what happened yesterday. Do, do, do you see what I'm getting at? No, no. I I guess I guess if I you see totally disavow that, at, yeah. I just don't think that's a correct description of. of I mean, 
maybe maybe you're right as a matter of psychology that lots of people feel that's going on in the Newcomb problem. I just want yeah. to insist that it is it's, not. It's not how it's actually set up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. But other ones where, where I feel um, you don't get um, that effect as much is uh, the, the, the smoking lesion problem uh, and also the psychopath button. Do you, do you just want to exp- explain those two uh, quickly if you can? Um, so the smoking lesion, I think, is structurally very similar to the Newcomb problem. It just puts different content in the story. Mm. So the idea here is there are two genetic types of people. One type of person has the smoking lesion and the other type of person does not have the smoking lesion. What the smoking lesion predisposes you to, if you have it, is two things. Firstly, it makes it more likely that you'll choose to smoke. And secondly, it makes it more likely that you'll get cancer. And in this story, smoking does not cause cancer. And you know all of this stuff. Your decision in that problem is whether or not to smoke. And there you could have the same two intuitions as the ones I described in the Newcomb problem. You should, you could think, well, I should smoke because, look, either I've got the smoking lesion or not, and nothing I do is going to change that fact, and I happen to enjoy smoking, so it's just strictly better for me either way to smoke than not. That's the causal decision theorist intuition. Or here the evidential decision theorist intuition would be, no, I really don't want to smoke because, look, if I smoke, then probably I've got this lesion. So um, and if I've my got this lesion, then probably I'll get cancer. So prob- probably if I smoke, I'll get cancer, and that's bad, so I better not smoke. I think in that problem, to my intuition, the evidential decision theorist story sounds less intuitively plausible, but I'm not sure why that's the case. Yeah, it's funny because it... The, the idea is that uh, smoking in this case doesn't, like, in fact, lower your life expectancy, but it lowers your expectancy of how long you're going to live. If that makes According sense. to one notion of expectancy, yeah. Yeah. So, so in that case, you you feel like it's just more straightforwardly intuitive to do the causal thing. That's my gut reaction to that case. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how widely shared that is. Yeah, and, and the psychopath button. All right. So, um, in the psychopath button case, imagine that there's a button in front of you, and what this button does, if you press it, is that it causes all psychopaths in the world to die. This may, by the way, include you if you turn out to be a psychopath, but you're not sure whether you're a psychopath or not. Your decision is whether or not to press this button, and your preferences are as follows. You'd really like to kill all the psychopaths in the world, provided you're not one of them, but you definitely don't want to kill all psychopaths in the world if you're one of them. That's the price that's too high to be worth paying by your lights. You currently have very low credence that you're a psychopath, but the catch is you have very high credence that only a psychopath would press this kind of button. Mm. Okay, so now your decision is whether to press this button or not. And the problem is that you seem to be kind of caught in a loop, right? So if you press the button, then probably you're a psych... Like after updating on the fact that you decided to press the button, you have high credence that you're a psychopath. So then you have high credence that pressing this button is going to kill you as well as all the other psychopaths. So you have high credence that this is a really bad idea. So you really... if After conditionalizing on the fact that you've decided to press the button, deciding to press the button looks like a really bad decision. But similarly, if you conditionalize on your having decided not to press the button, um, then by the epistemic lights that you then have, that also looks like a really bad idea because if you've decided not to press the button, then you have very low credence that you're a psychopath. And so you think pressing the button has much higher expected value than not pressing it. So it looks like either decision you make after you conditionalize on the fact that you've made that decision, you think it was a really bad decision. Yeah. What do you make of that one? Because in that case, it feels like you shouldn't press the button to me. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a decision problem where it's much less obvious Hmm. what the right thing to say is. I'm kind of enamored of some interesting work by people like Frank Arnzenius, who've argued that in this case, you have to expand your conception of the available acts beyond just press the button and not press the button Hmm. and admit some kind of mixture where the equilibrium can be do something that leads to pressing the button with probability one third or something like that. So Anzinius's work argues that once you've got those mixed acts in your space, you can find stable points where you continue to endorse the the mixed act in question, even after having conditionalized on the fact that that's your plan. Interesting. So this is like, will you pre-commit to some probability of doing it? Yeah, there are things that are deeply unsatisfying about um, that route but I'm not sure the alternatives are very much better. I think this is we're now into the space of interesting open problems in decision theory. So, so what what is the cutting edge here? And are there kind of other other decision theories besides kind of causal decision theory or evidential decision theory that you think have something to go, going for them? Yeah, there's a few others. So, Rafe Wedgwood, one of my colleagues, well, used to be one of my colleagues at Oxford, developed a decision theory called benchmark decision theory, which is supposed to be a competitor to both causal and evidential decision theory. Um, the paper by Frank Arnzinius I just alluded to 
explores what he calls deliberational variants on existing decision theories in response to cases like the psychopath button. So these are like formalizations of what the decision theory looks like in this richer space of mixed acts. And then, as many of your listeners will know, like in the space of AI research, people have been throwing around terms like functional decision theory and timeless decision theory and updateless decision theory. I think it's a lot less clear exactly what these putative alternatives are supposed to be. Like the literature on those kind of decision theories hasn't been written up with the level of precision and rigor that characterizes the discussion of causal and evidential decision theory. So it's a little bit unclear, at least to my lights, whether there's genuinely competitive decision theory on the table there or just some intriguing ideas that might one day in the future lead to a rigorous alternative. Okay, cool. Well, hopefully at some point in the future, we might do a whole episode on uh, just, just, on, just on decision theory where we can really dive into the, to the pros and cons of each of those. But just to back up, so, it sounded, so you were trying to then like draw an analogy between these decision theories and epistemic decision theory, and then you found that you couldn't make it work. Is that right? Uh, so I think the following thing is the case. For any decision theory you can write down in the practical case, you can write down a structurally analogous decision theory in the epistemic case. Mm-hmm. However... There's no guarantee that the assessments of whether such and such a decision theory fits our intuitions about what's rational. There's no guarantee that those assessments are going to be the same in the practical and the epistemic case. So it could, for example, be that when we're thinking about practical rationality, our intuitions scream out that causal decision theory is the right approach. Mm. But when we're thinking about epistemic rationality, our intuitions scream out that somebody who updates their beliefs according to causal epistemic decision theory is behaving in a way that's wildly epistemically irrational. Like there can be that kind of difference. So there's there's the same menu of decision theory options on the table in both cases, but the plausibilities of the decision theories might not match. And what I was worried about and maybe concluded in the epistemic case is that all the decision theories you can write down by writing down the structural analogue of all the existing ones in the practical domain. When you write down the analogues in the epistemic domain, none of them does a very good job of matching what seem to be our intuitions about how the intuitive notion of epistemic rationality works. So then I just got very puzzled about what our intuitive notion of epistemic rationality was up to and why and how we had a notion of rationality that behaved in that way and that kind of thing. Is there an intuitive explanation of what goes wrong with just causal epistemic decision theory? Okay, so here's a puzzle case that... I think shows that a causal epistemic decision theory fails to match the way most people's intuitions behave about what's actually epistemically rational versus not. So suppose you're you're going for a walk and you can see clearly in front of you a child playing on the grass. And suppose you know that just around the corner in, let's say, some kind of playhouse, there are 10 further children. Um, each of these Additional children might or might not come out to join the first one on the grass in a minute. Suppose, though, now this is this example is science fictional, so you have to bear with that. Sure. Suppose the, these 10 further children who are currently around the corner are able to read your mind. And the way they're going to decide whether or not to come out and play in a minute depends on what beliefs you yourself decide to form now. So one thing you have to decide now about what degrees of belief to form is what's your degree of belief that there is now a child in front of you playing on the grass? So recall the setup. The setup specified that there is one there. You can see her. She's definitely there. So our intuitive notion of epistemic rationality, I take it, entails that it's epistemically rational. You're epistemically required to have degree of belief one, basically, or very close to it, that there's currently a child in front of you. But like in all these cases, there's going to be a catch. The catch here is that If you form degree of belief one, as arguably you should, or something very close to it, um, that there's a child in front of you now, then what each of these 10 additional children are going to do is they're going to flip a coin and they'll come out to play if their coin lands heads, they'll they'll stay inside and not come out if their coin lands tails. Whereas if you form a degree of belief zero, that there's a child in front of you now, then each of these additional 10 ones will definitely come out to play. And suppose that you know all this stuff about the setup then it looks as though causal epistemic decision theory is going to tell you the rational thing to do is to have degree of belief zero that there's a child in front of you now, despite the fact that you can see that there in fact is one. And the reason is the way this scenario has been set up, the way I stipulated it, if you form degree of belief zero that there's a child in front of you now, then you know with probability one there are going to be 10 more children there in a minute. And so you can safely form degree of belief one in all those other children being there in a minute's time. Mm. So when you when we assess your epistemic state overall, yeah, you get some negative points in accuracy terms for your belief about the first child, but you're guaranteed to get full marks 
mm. regarding your epistemic state about those 10 other children. Mm. Whereas if you do the intuitively epistemically rational thing and you have degree of belief, one, that there's a child in front of you now, then it's a matter of randomness for each of the other 10 children, whether they come out or not. So the best you can do is kind of hedge your bets and have degree of belief uh. half for either of the other 10 children. But you know you're not going to get very good epistemic marks for that because uh. whether they come out to play or not, you only get half marks. So when we assess your overall epistemic state, it's going to be better in the case where you do the intuitively irrational thing than the case where you do the intuitively rational thing. But causal epistemic decision theory, it seems, is committed to assessing your belief state in this global kind of way. What you wanted to maximize, I take it, was the total accuracy, the total degree of fit between your beliefs about everything and the truth. So we've got a kind of mismatch that at least I couldn't see any way of erasing by any remotely minor tweak to causal epistemic decision theory. So it boils down to if you form a false belief now, like a small false belief, then the world will become easier to predict. And so you'll, you'll be able to forecast what's going on or have like more accurate beliefs in the in the future. So you pay a small cost now for more accurate beliefs in the future. Whereas like if you believe the true thing now, which like in some sense seems to be the rational thing to do, then then you'll then you'll do worse later on because the world's become more um, more chaotic. It's kind of like that. I mean, there's a there's a there's an inaccuracy in what you just said, which was important for me, but I don't know if this is getting into like <laughs> nitty gritty research as pedantry. The thing that, that for me is importantly inaccurate about, about what you just said is it's not about having inaccurate beliefs now, but then getting accurate beliefs in the future. Because if that were the only problem, then you could just stipulate, look, this, dis this decision theory is just optimizing for oh, accuracy present. of beliefs now. Mm. But so actually what, what you're having to decide now is both things so you have to decide now what's your degree of belief now that there's a child in front of you and also what's your degree of belief now about whether there will, will be, be further children there in a minute so all the questions are about your beliefs now and that's why there's no kind of easy block to making the trade-off that seems intuitively problematic yeah um so are you still working on this epistemic uh, decision theory stuff or have you kind of moved on no no this this is a paper from about five years ago and i've yeah. i've since moved much more in the direction of Papers that are more directly related to effective altruism, global priorities type concerns. Okay, yeah. Is anyone carrying carrying the torch forward? I mean, do, do you think it matters very much? I mean, I think it matters in the same way that this more abstract theoretical research ever matters. Hmm. And I just tell the standard boring story about how and why that does matter. Like, you know, these abstract domains of inquiry generate insights. Every now and then those insights turn out to be practically relevant in surprising ways you can't forecast them, but experience shows there are lots of them. Like you can tell that kind of story, and I think it applies here as well as it does everywhere else. I don't think there's anything unusually practically relevant about this domain compared to other domains of abstract theoretical inquiry. Yeah. If I did, I might still be working on it. Yeah. Um, this is maybe a bit of a diversion, but, but what do you think of that kind of academic's plea uh, that, uh, you know, whatever they're looking into, who can say how it will be useful to so kind of all, all basic research uh, is, is useful and they should just do whatever they're most interested in? I think it is implausible if it's supposed to be an answer to the question, what's the thing you could do with your life that has the highest expected value? Hmm. But I think it is right as an answer to a question like, why is this of some value? Yeah, why should the public fund this at all, or mm. that kind of question? Yeah, do, do you have a, a view on whether we should be doing kind of more of this kind of, of basic exploratory research where the value isn't clear, or more applied research where uh, the value is very clear, but perhaps like the, the, the upper tail is is more cut off? Yeah, I mean it depends partly on who we is. So, mm. and one interpretation of your question would be: Do I think the effective altruist community should be doing more basic research? And there, I think the answer is definitely yes. Hmm. And that's why the Global Priorities Institute exists. Hmm. That's kind of our one way of describing at the most basic level what we take our brief to be is take issues that are interesting and important by effective altruist lights and submit them to the kind of critical scrutiny and intellectual rigor that's characteristic of academia rather than just writing them up on effective altruist blogs and not getting them into the academic literature or not doing the thing where you spend one year perfecting one footnote to work out exactly how it's meant to go. Like we <laughs> tend to do more of that, that last kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's push on and talk about the kind of research that you're doing now. Yeah. What, what are the main topics that you're looking into and that, and that GPI is looking into, or at least that you have been looking into over the last few years? 
Sure. So uh, GPI has existed for maybe a year. It's officially existed for a bit less than that, but that's roughly the time scale on which we've be, we've had people working more or less full time on GPI issues. And the first thing we did was draw up a monstrous research agenda where we initially tried to write down every topic we can think of where we thought there was scope for somebody to write an academic research article making rigorous either an existing current of thought in the effective altruist community where effective altruists have kind of decided what they think they believe but the argument hasn't been made fully rigorous or there's an interesting open question where effective altruists really don't know and don't even think they know what the answer is Mm. but it seems plausible that the tools of various academic disciplines and we're especially interested in philosophy and economics might be brought to bear to give some guidance on what's a more versus a less plausible answer to this practically important question. So through that lens, we ended up with something like a 50 page document of possible research topics. So clearly we had to prioritize within that. (laughs) And what we've been focusing on in the initial sort of six to eight months is what we call the long termism paradigm, where long termism will be something like the view that the vast majority of the value of our actions, or at least our highest expected value actions, the vast majority of the value of those actions lies in the far future rather than the nearer term. So we're interested in what it looks like when you make the strongest case you can for that claim, and then also what follows from that claim and how rigorous can we make the arguments about what follows from that claim. So for example, lots of people in the EA community think that insofar as you accept long-termism, what you should be focusing on is reducing risks of premature human extinction rather than, for example, trying to speed up economic progress. Um, But nobody, to my knowledge, has really tried to rigorously sit down and write down why that's the case. So that's one of the things we've been trying to do. Yeah. How strong do you think the the case is for for long-termism? It sounds like you're like sympathetic to it, but how likely do you think it might be that you could change your mind? Okay, yeah, no, definitely sympathetic to it. I'm a little bit wary of answering the question about how likely is it that I think I might change my mind because even trying to predict that can sometimes psychologically have the effect of closing one's mind as a researcher Uh, and reducing one's ability to just follow argument where it leads. So I'm much more comfortable in the frame of mind where I think, yeah, okay, roughly speaking, I find this claim very plausible, Hmm. but I know as a general matter that when I do serious research, when I write, when I sit down and try and make things fully rigorous, I end up in some quite surprising places. But it's very important that while I'm in that process, I'm in a frame of mind of just following argument wherever it leads, rather than some kind of partisan motivated cognition. Yeah, yeah. Um, So yeah, I think it's extremely likely that I'll change my mind on many aspects of how to think about the problem. I don't really know how to predict what's the probability I'd change my mind on the eventual conclusion. Sure. Yeah, so I guess uh, what are the what are the main controversies here? What what are maybe the the, the weakest points that people kind of push on if they if they're wanting to question long termism? Okay, so one thing that's controversial is how to think about discounting future welfare. Hmm. So it's very common um, in economic analyses of policy recommendations, for example, to at least discount future goods, and that's very clearly also the right thing to do, by the way, because if you think that people are going to be richer in the future, then a marginal unit of concrete material goods has less value in the future than it does today, just because of considerations of diminishing marginal utility. Mm. If you think people are going to be poorer in the future, then the reverse is true. So Mm. you should either positively or negatively discount future goods relative Mm. to present ones. That's pretty uncontroversial. What's controversial is whether you should treat welfare in the future as having different weight from welfare in the present. Moral philosophers are more or less unanimous on the view that you should not you should not discount future we- future welfare, and that's an important input into the case for long termism. Because if you think you should discount future welfare at say an exponential rate going forwards in time, then even a very small discount rate is going to dramatically suppress um, the value of possible future welfare we can get summed across all generations. So you don't get the kind of overwhelming importance of the far future picture that you get if you have a zero discount rate on future welfare. Mm. So that will be one of them. And another salient one would be issues in population ethics. Mm. So if we're talking about premature human extinction in particular, you get the case for thinking it's overwhelmingly important to prevent or reduce the chance of premature human extinction if you're thinking of lives that are, quote, lost in the sense that they never happened in the first place. 
place because of premature human extinction mm. in the same way that you think of lives that are lost in the sense of they got cut short, mm. like people dying early. If you think that those two things are basically morally on a par, so very valuable lives that would contain love and joy and projects and all that good stuff failed to happen that would otherwise have happened, that's just as bad if people fail to be born as it is if they die prematurely. If you're in that frame of mind, um, then you're very likely to conclude that it's overwhelmingly important we prevent premature human extinction just because of how long the future could be if we don't go prematurely extinct. Whereas if you think there's a morally important sense in which a life that never starts in the first place is not a loss. If you think this is a like a victimless situation, this per because of because, because premature human extinction in fact happens, let's say this person never gets born, so this person doesn't exist. So there in fact is no person we're talking about here. There is no person who experiences this loss. If you're in that kind of frame of mind, then you are likely to conclude that it doesn't really matter, or it doesn't matter anything like as much um, whether we prevent premature extinction or not. So those are, those will be two examples of cases where there's something that's controversial within moral philosophy that's going to have a big impact on what you think about the truth of long-termism versus not. Yeah, I guess a, a third argument that I hear made um, maybe even more than those two these days is uh, the question of whether the future is going to be good on balance. So like, is it worth preserving the future? Um, or is it just like very unclear whether uh, it's going to be positive or negative morally, even like even taking account uh, the welfare of future people? But maybe, but maybe that's like less of a philosophical issue. It's more of a practical issue. And so not so much under the purview of, of GPI. I think it is under the purview of GPI. I mean, it's an issue that has both philosophical and practical components, and the philosophical components of it would be under the purview of GPI. So and part of the input into that third discussion is going to be, well, what exactly is it that's valuable anyway? What does it take for a life to count as good on balance versus bad on balance? So, you know, there are some there are some views, for example, that think you can never be in a better situation than never having been born because... Yeah. Like the best possible thing is to have none of your preferences frustrated. Well, if you're never born, so you never have any preferences, then in particular, you never have any frustrated preferences, so you get full marks. The ideal if life. you are born, some of the things you wanted are not going to happen, so you're always going to have negative marks. There yeah. are those kind of views out there, and they're obviously yeah. going to be unsympathetic to the claim that preventing human extinction is a good thing. Um, and they tend to be, you know, like that one, in my opinion, they tend to be pretty wacky views as a matter of philosophy. Yeah. But there's definitely a project there of kind of going through and seeing whether there's any plausible philosophical view mm. that will be likely to generate the negative value claim in practice. Yeah. Okay. So I'm a bit wary of, of diving into the discount rate issue because uh, we've talked about that before with with, with Toby Ord on the show. Uh, and it seems like philosophers are just kind of uh, sing with one voice on this topic. And it's, I mean, I, yeah, my background is in economics and I feel it's just like economists are, are getting confused about this. They're they're confusing an instrumental tool that they've like started putting into their formulas with like some fundamental moral issue uh, in as much as um, economists even even disagree with uh, not having a, a pure time discount rate, uh, which it seems uh, my, my impression, at least uh, from my vantage point, is that economists are coming around to this because this issue has been raised enough and uh, they're, they're progressively getting persuaded. Uh, is, is, is that your perception or? To some extent, I think. The more foundationally minded economists tend to broadly agree with the moral philosophers on this. So, for example, um, Christian Gollier has recently written a magisterial book on discounting. Mm. And he basically repeats the line that has been repeated by both moral philosophers and historically eminent economists such as Ramsey, Harrod, and so forth. Of mm. Like, yeah, there's really just sort of no discussion to be had here. Clearly, this thing should be zero. Mm. Um, I think there are still some interesting discussions one could have, like, for example, I think the concerns about excessive sacrifice mm. are worth discussing. So this is the worry that if you really take seriously the proposition that the discount rate for future welfare should be zero, then what's going to follow from that is that you should give basically all of your assets to the future. You should end up with what's an intuitively absurdly high ratio of investment mm. to consumption. Something needs to be said about that. And I think there are things that can be said about that. Um, but a lot of them usually answered. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about that. So I think uh, here's a discussion I think that I think could do with some more having than it no than it normally gets. Philosophers tend to think about the discounting question in terms of what's the right theory of the good, as philosophers would say. That is, if you're just trying to order possible worlds in terms of better from a completely impartial perspective, then what's the mathematical formula that represents the morally correct betterness ordering? Mm. That's one question in the vicinity that you might be asking. 
A subtly different question you might be asking is, if you are a morally decent person, meaning you conform to all the requirements of morality, hmm. but you're, you're not completely impartially motivated, then what are the constraints on what's a permissible preference ordering for you to have over acts? So it's much more plausible to argue that you could use a formula that has a non-zero discount rate for future welfare if you're doing the second thing. That's much more plausible mm. than thinking that you could have a non-zero discount rate for future welfare if you're doing the betterness thing. I mean, actually, I beg the question because I said you should be thinking of betterness in terms of completely impartial value, mm. and that closes the question. But yeah. <laughs> remove the word impartial and, yeah. and just talk about sort of betterness overall. Yeah. And then it remains, I think, substantively implausible that you can have a non-zero discount rate for future welfare. But even if you're asking that second question, the one about what's a rationally permitted preference ordering over acts, not just rationally permitted, but taking into account morality, then I think there are more subtle arguments you can make for why the right response to this excessive sacrifice argument is not to have something that looks like a formula for value but incorporates discounting future well-being. Mm -hmm. It's rather to have something that's more like a conjunction of a completely impartial value function mm. with some constraints on how much morality can require from you, where those constraints are not themselves baked into the um, the value function. Yeah, I guess I, I've never found these arguments from demandingness terribly persuasive philosophically, because I just don't know what reason we have to think that um, the true, like a, a correct moral theory or a correct moral approach would not be very demanding. It seems, if anything, like it would be suspicious if we found that... Uh, the moral theory that we thought was right um, just happened to correspond with our intuitive evolved sense of like how demanding morality ought to be. Um, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm broadly sympathetic to the perspective you're taking here, maybe unsurprisingly, but trying to take, uh, trying to play devil's advocate a little bit. Yeah. I think what the the economists or the people who are concerned about the excessive sacrifice argument are likely to say here is like, well. You know, insofar as you're right about morality being this extremely demanding thing, it looks like we're going to have reason to talk about a second thing as well, mm. which is maybe like watered down morality or pseudo morality, and that the second thing what is going we're to be actually going to like, ask of people. Yeah, the, well, the second thing is going, to, is going to be something like what we actually plan to act according to, or mm. what it's reasonable to ask of people, or what we're going to issue as advice to the government given that they don't have morally perfect motivations or something like that. And then, by the way, this second thing is the thing that's going to be more directly action guiding in practice. So, yeah, you philosophers can go and have your conversation about what this abstract morality abstractly requires, but nobody's actually going to pay any attention to it when they act. They're going to pay attention to this other thing. Mm. So, by the way, we've won the practical argument. I think there's something to that line of response. We shouldn't be dismissive of, of where they're coming from here. Yeah, no, I think that that, that does make some sense. Uh, okay, so, so you've written a long review article about discount rates that we'll stick up a link to if people are interested in, in exploring this more. Let's talk um, now about uh, population ethics, which is another topic that you've written a long uh, a summary article uh, on. Yeah, do you just want to, uh, I guess uh, you've already explained what, what the question is kind of, or like at least one of the debates within population ethics around uh, whether, you know, creating more people or like wh whether we should value the lives of people who don't exist yet uh, equally to people who are alive now. What do you see as kind of the, the main controversies or main uncertainties in, in, in population ethics? And where did you end up standing after reviewing that literature? Sure. OK, so in, in slightly more rigorous terms than the way I presented it a minute ago, the, the basic question for me in population ethics is if you're trying to compare states of affairs that differ from one another over the number of people who ever get to exist, for example, a scenario where humanity gets to exist for another billion years versus a scenario where it goes extinct in 100 years time, what's the right ordering of those possible worlds relative to one another in terms of better and worse. So when you first ask this question, the two maybe most obvious answers people might give are um, first one, so-called total utilitarianism. Well, the thing we're trying to maximize here is total welfare summed over all people. So among other things, um, other things being equal, the more people, the better, provided they have positive well-being, like they have lives that are worth living. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the first option, total utilitarianism. In the variable population context, that comes radically apart from a second way of ordering these worlds, which you might call average utilitarianism, where the quantity you're trying to maximize is not total welfare added up across all people, but average welfare summed across all people. So you can see these come apart because in a scenario where, for example, you have to pay some significant cost now in order to make it the case that humanity survives for longer. Mm -hmm. In at least some variants of that scenario, the average utilitarian is going to say, no, this is not a cost worth paying. You drag the average down too much. 
Whereas the total utilitarian is very likely to say basically any cost you come up with is going to be worth paying if it means we get to extend the, f- the future of humanity by far enough. So I mean, that's the basic question. I mean, when you dig into the details of those theories, you come up with scenarios where total utilitarianism gives a, a, a betterness verdict that strikes most people as radically counterintuitive. But then you can also come up with other scenarios where average utilitarianism generates a verdict that most people regard as radically counterintuitive. But furthermore, every other alternative theory you try to write down, so maybe it's not total, maybe it's not average, maybe it's something else. I've got this other great theory, three. Uh, It turns out that theory three is also going to have some radically counterintuitive conclusions. So the history of population ethics over the last 30 years has been roughly, first people try to find a theory that has no counterintuitive conclusions, Um, Then they realize that this provably can't be done. So we now have so-called impossibility theorems where people write down a list of intuitive desiderata, like I want my ideal theory to have the following six features. And then you have a mathematical theorem showing that there is no theory in in mathematical space. There is no theory that has all of these features. So we now understand that population axiology is a case of choosing your poison. You have to decide of your initial intuitive desiderata, which one you're um, least unwilling to give up. And then that will guide your choice of theory. I think you asked me which my favorite theory was at the end of the day. Um, Mm. It's totally utilitarianism. Yeah, (laughs) me too. But uh, yeah, maybe you could describe kind of the the different the different poison pills that uh, that you might consider taking. Uh, What are what are some other like semi plausible theories? Um, Okay, those are two different questions. I think let me answer. first. (laughs) (laughs) All right, different poison pills. So If you accept total utilitarianism, then you're committed to the so-called repugnant conclusion. This is, of course, a totally question-begging name. Many people think this conclusion (laughs) isn't repugnant, but whatever. Anyway, here's the thing you're committed to. Consider any state of affairs you like and imagine it to be as good as you like. So you can imagine there existing any number of people and you can imagine their lives being arbitrarily good. Mm -hmm. Call that state of affairs A. Write down the amount of total welfare that you get in state of affairs A. Now I can easily come up with an alternative, at least metaphysically possible state of affairs, usually gets called Z in the literature, so let's call it Z, uh, which has the following two features. Feature one, nobody has a life that contains more than 0.00001 units of welfare. So everybody has a life that's barely worth living, as we say. Um, but, f- but the second feature is that state of affairs Z has higher total welfare than state of affairs A. Clearly, I can easily generate a state of affairs that has these two features just by making the population in Z large enough. So if Z has 10 trillion, 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 et cetera, people, um, by iterating the trillions, I can eventually make the total welfare of Z larger than whatever you said the total welfare of A was. Okay, so here we have a situation where you imagined what you want, what you thought of as being an extremely good state of affairs, A, and I've generated one that according to total utilitarianism is better, but in which no individual has a life that's more than barely worth living. Most people find this conclusion repugnant. So most people take this to be very strong evidence against the truth of total utilitarianism. Mm. Um, not everybody, but at least for, for most people, that's their initial reaction. Okay, so suppose you're convinced by that. Suppose you decide, right, total utilitarianism can't be true then. Where else might you look? Well, you might try average utilitarianism, uh, but that just commits you to a different poison. So suppose now you have two states of affairs, uh, let's call them this time A and B, and suppose that there's some set of people that exist in both A and in B. So there's a, there's a common subpopulation, that is to say, and suppose that for these people, life is exactly as good in B as it is in A. There's nothing at stake for this subpopulation in the decision between A and B. What's the difference between A and B? Well, the difference is in what you add to this common subpopulation. For state of affairs A, you add a large number of people who have lives that are worth living. They're positive welfare lives, but they're a lot less good than the lives of the common subpopulation. In contrast, in state of affairs B, you add a smaller, num- a much smaller number of additional people who live lives of just unmitigated misery, pain and torture. So these are people who would really prefer that they'd never been born. Their lives have negative welfare. What's the problem here for average utilitarianism? Well, the problem is that clearly, I take it, state of affairs A is better than B, because to get state of affairs A, you added some people who were glad to be alive, and to get state of affairs B, you instead added some people who wish they'd never been born. So A's got to be better than B. But because the sizes of the added subpopulations were different, it can easily be the case that the large number of positive welfare people you added to A dragged the average down by more than the small number of people of with negative welfare that you added to B dragged the average down. That is to say, 
B might have higher average welfare than A, and therefore average utilitarianism would have to prefer B to A, hmm. which was intuitively clearly the wrong result. So that's that's one of the standard examples of the poison for average utilitarianism. It seems like average utilitarianism gets into severe problems whenever it goes into negative territory, because you can imagine a world where like everyone is living a very bad life, and then you add some more people who are living bad, like unpleasant lives, but not quite as bad as the other people, and that's pulling up the average, and therefore it's desirable to add them, which I think that's right. kind of like everyone th- thinks is uh, pretty unappealing. Okay, good. Yeah, that's probably a better example to illustrate the point because it's a lot simpler and it <laughs> makes basically the same point. Yeah, and I guess it also means that like whether we should say have children or not have children kind of depends on potentially like how many aliens there are like elsewhere in the universe and like how well their lives are going. Um, this would be like very morally relevant. That's right. Yeah. And also it depends on how things went in the distant past. Yeah. So are there um, are there like variations on average utilitarianism that try to rescue it from, from these problems? Um, not really, no. I mean, people try to write down theories that are some kind of hybrid between total and average utilitarianism mm. that are supposed to have the good features of each theory and the bad features of neither, but it doesn't really work. Yeah, yeah. I think someone actually forwarded me something called market utilitarianism recently, which was meant to be some yeah, some mix of like total and average, but it just seemed quite odd to me. I didn't understand the appeal at all. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think, oh, yeah, it, I think it was non popular that term. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it was non population ethicists working on this. Anyway, okay, so uh, so total is unappealing to like quite a lot of people, and average seems to have like maybe even more severe problems. So, what what other options are there? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. You can try. So you you can try the thing we just mentioned. So you can try writing down a theory that's some kind of mathematical combination of total and average utilitarianism. Hmm. That doesn't really work because you either end up just still having all the problems faced by average utilitarianism, at least at sufficiently large populations. Hmm. Yeah. Um, or you end up with a theory that's radically inegalitarian. So it manages to avoid the repugnant conclusion um, and the other problems we discussed for average utilitarianism um, by being radically pro inequalities between people. So the very best, of, very best off people are counted as much more morally important than the worst off people, or something like that. And that's like, and even in the fixed population context, <laughs> never mind population ethics. Um, that's a position that nobody considered holding until population <laughs> efforts came along, and for, for pretty good reason. Yeah. Um, there, isn't there perfectionism? This idea that, like, yeah, how good the world is depends on kind of how how well the best person's life went, or they should get some like special consideration. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't find that appealing either. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I imagine that it's like people whose lives are going very well who advocate for that. But yeah. So I thought you might say that um, there's attempts to um, make person affecting view. Uh, more yeah, I was going to say that then next. Yeah, okay. So let, let's let's talk about person affecting views. Okay, all right. So, but person affecting views try to make rigorous sense of the idea that bringing an extra person into existence is neither good nor bad for that person. And furthermore, some principle like the following is true: if state of affairs B is better than A, then it must be better than A for at least one person. So, in this kind of view. If A and B just differ by the addition of extra people, so say there's a common subpopulation, and then in B you've added some people who don't exist in A, then even if these extra people have positive welfare, a person-affecting theorist will say, well, B can't be better than A if the welfare of the common subpopulation is the same in A and B, because these extra people that you've added in B don't count as having been benefited by being brought into existence. B isn't better than A for them, Mm. according to a somebody who's thinking in the spirit of person affecting theory. The problem with this project is just that when you actually try to write write down what's the ordering of states of affairs in a variable population context that the person affecting theorist is trying to advocate, it's really hard to do it in a way that doesn't run into either inconsistency in the sense of, say, cycles, like you can go around in a circle, A is better than B is better than C is better than A, um, or you end up committed to massive incomparability. So some versions of person affecting theory will say things like, if A and B have different numbers of people in them, so say in A, precisely 1,000 billion people people are ever born and in B precisely 1000 billion and one people are ever born then one version of person affecting theory would say that A and B are incomparable in terms of betterness that is it's not the case that A is better than B it's not the case that B is better than A and it's also not the case that they're equally good they just can't be compared so you can go for a theory that says that but then that's of course really implausible if we add that in A everybody has lives of bliss and in B everybody has lives of torture then you know clearly we don't want that much incomparability so that, that, that yeah there are some interesting sounding ideas 
that have the person affecting label attached to them, but it's very unclear what the theory is there. And whenever somebody actually tries to write down a theory matching person affecting ideas, it turns out to look crazy for one or another reason. Yeah. Is there any way of making intuitive why these theories uh, either yeah, you produce incomparability or contradictions or like very odd results? Well, we could make some steps in that direction. I mean, one thing you can do is try and think through what it would look like if you try to make rigorous the claim that if you add an extra person, then you make things not better, not worse. You leave them exactly equally as good as they were before. So suppose we, we say that's the principle we're going to try and develop into a theory. Um, then you end up conflicting with the so-called Pareto principle, right? Because take your status quo state of affairs A. Now we'll augment A in two different ways. First, we'll create state of affairs B1, and then separately, we'll create state of affairs B2. We create B1 by adding a person who has welfare level, say, 100. And we create B2 by adding a person who has a lower welfare level, let's say, 50. But in both of these, in both B1 and B2, everybody who already exists in an A has the same welfare level that they had in A. So in particular, B1 and B2 agree with one another on the welfare of everybody except the additional person. Okay, so now what do we get? Well, when we compare B1 and B2, it's obvious by the Pareto principle that B1 is better than B2 because you've got a bunch of people for whom nothing's at stake and then you've got one person who's better off in B1 than in B2. So B1 has to be better than B2. But yet the principle we were trying to defend said that B1 is exactly as good as A and it also said that B2 is exactly as good as A. So now by transitivity of equally as good as, you know, B2 is exactly as good as A is exactly as good as B1. So B1 and B2 have to be equally as good. But hang on, we just said B1 is better than B2. So we have a contradiction. So that's like one example of how this maybe initially plausible sounding principle ends up running into structural trouble. How how do people who support the person affecting view end up dealing with cases where we expect that there, that there will be people like, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to have a child. They don't exist yet. And then I could do something now that will make this child like have a better life or a worse life, um, but they're not alive today. And it seems like you want to have this intuition that like, if I can do something today that will make this child who almost certainly will exist in some form to have a better life, that that would be a good thing to do, or it could be a good thing to do. But it seems like if you're strongly committed to the person affecting view where like only people who are alive right now matter, that they would have to say, no, there's like nothing that you could do now that could benefit like your future child that would be morally good. Okay, good. So that question highlights the fact that there are, there's another dimension on which you've got a choice point of how you make the person affecting view precise. So you're interpreting it to mean only people who are alive today have moral importance. And therefore, there's nothing that I should do motivated by making things better for my future child. So that's a, that's a so-called presentist theory. That theory is actually really implausible, quite aside from considerations of population ethics when we think about it. Um, so we were talking about discounting, you know, should we assign the same moral weight to people in the future as we did to people in the past? This is a theory that assigns zero moral weight to people in the future. Mm. So that's the most extreme version of discounting you could possibly come up with. Mm. Um, that kind of theory is going to generate conclusions that are intuitively completely crazy mm. because it's going to say things like, if you can bury toxic waste in one of two ways, one of which will be completely unproblematic in a thousand years time, and one of which will com condemn everyone to lives of pain and torture in a thousand years time. Yeah, no there's difference. nothing to choose. It doesn't matter. These people have no moral importance. <laughs> Do whatever you like. That's, I take it, completely crazy. If it's costless for us, at least, mm. um, then there's an extremely strong case for doing the thing that's safe. Um, so that that's on a, maybe a more intuitive level why a presentist version of population uh, of person affecting theory is not plausible. You might try and rescue the theory by dropping the presentism bit of it. So you might say, look, I never meant to say that it's only presently existing people that have moral importance. I meant to say something like it's only people who are going to exist regardless of which decision I make mm. that have moral importance. So if you're in a decision situation where whether or not this person exists depends on which decision I make now, in that situation, you might say the interest of this person don't plug into the algorithm for how I should make my decision. So that has a that way of thinking has a bit of a more subtle relationship to your question about things that might affect your future children's welfare, because some things you might do now make your future child better off without changing the fact that they get born, maybe. Mm. Yeah. But a lot of things you might do now to affect the welfare of your future child will affect not only the welfare of your future child, but also which future child you have. Basically, anything anything that affects which sperm wins the race yeah. changes the identity of your future child, and that's pretty much everything you do. So. Yeah, uh, because like if you if I'm delayed by a second, then it's a different sperm, probably. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the non-identity problem, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, which is like just like given the world as it is today, like yeah, the, the the identity of like all future people is incredibly fragile. That like even like tiny tiny changes to the world now seem to change like the the identities of almost all future generations. Yeah. Is that is that like a fundamental problem with a the theory, or is it just uh, that it doesn't gel very well with how humans reproduce? Like, could you imagine a, a future world in which uh, reproduction is, or like the identity of like different future agents uh, comparing in different worlds, it, that their their identities are not so fragile, and then the theory d- doesn't look so unappealing? Yeah, you could try that. I mean, you could say I've got a person affecting theory that generates very implausible results in worlds like ours, but generates quite plausible results in some set of some subset of possible worlds that doesn't include ours it's very hard to see why that would be reassuring i mean Mm. there's a nearby thing that people sometimes do try to advocate which is moral philosophers generally assume that in order to be acceptable a moral theory has to generate plausible results across all possible worlds Mm. and some people want to push back on that and say no no no, it's it's enough if my theory generates plausible results in the actual world and in worlds that are like reasonably yeah. practically obtainable by things we could do in the actual world. Uh, so there's a, I think there's a sensible discussion to be had about whether that kind of restriction is satisfying. But a restriction to a subset of possible worlds that does not include the actual world is, I take it, not really going to help any theory. Yeah, I guess... The non-identity problem does seem to be a deal breaker, I imagine. To or like, it, it's not consistent with the intuitions of people who wanted to put forward the the person affecting view to begin with. But I guess I feel That's like right. slightly dishonest pushing that because I don't think that that that, they, that is the reason that I uh, would reject it. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, imagine that they tried to rescue it by saying, "Ah, oh, well, it's like it's your child in either case, so it's like it's close enough." Um, like even though they they kind of will be different people because they're different sperm, like produce them. I'm going to say that like still in these two situations, they count as the same person, and so you can mm-hmm. compare. I, well, actually, do, do people try doing that? Yes, yes. Yeah, so more more plausible versions of person affecting view, including some very good recent work, do pursue that kind of line. And I think the result there is a much more plausible version of a theory. What what do you make of these like new attempts to kind of rescue person affecting views by having like a, a perhaps like more looser sense of identity? Yeah, so I think some of the work that's been done in this space is quite promising. I'm particularly impressed by a paper on so-called saturating counterpart relations by um, Chris Meacham at UMass. So he has a sort of quite complicated technical formula for how you're supposed to line up the people in one state of affairs with the people in another state of affairs when the populations don't involve exactly the same people. Mm. But there's maybe a more or less natural correspondence you could draw between the, the two populations. And I think the theory he ends up with there is the best theory that I've seen in person affecting spirit. Um, I'm not quite sure what to make of it in terms of overall assessment. I think what he ends up saying at the end of the paper is, look, I myself am not really convinced this is a very good theory. I'm just claiming it's the best person affecting theory that there is. And I think I'd share that assessment. Yeah. It's definitely worth looking into. But I think mm-hmm. I'm having thought through the, I mean, the, the impossibility theorems we talked about earlier still apply here. It remains the case that every mathematically consistent theory of population ethics will have some poison bullet it has to bite and this is true of the Meacham person affecting theory no less than it's true of every other theory and I think my view at the end of the day is the repugnant conclusion is not actually that bad once you've seen what the alternatives are Um, but I don't think that's a cut and dried issue I can I can see reasonable people going different ways on that okay well we'll stick up a link to that paper so, so people can check that out I guess, yeah, I feel like with the Republican conclusion, what's going on psychologically is kind of uh, an in- inability to empathize with like many different agents simultaneously, that we can uh, put ourselves in the shoe of like one agent that has a very high level of welfare, but we just can't imagine being kind of a million agents that all t- collectively have like the-, the welfare of that one like very happy agent. And so it's kind of a trick that's being played on us where we can imagine depth of goodness, but not like width of like agency. Yeah, I think that's that's very plausible as a matter of the psychology. I think maybe another thing that's going on is when you're presented with this scenario of life barely worth living, it's kind of hard to maintain an intuitive grip on the idea that this is a positive thing. You know, mm. life barely worth living is meant to be worth living. It's meant to yeah. be positive. But your overwhelming intuitive reaction to it is, that's really depressing. I kind of hope life would be so much better than that. Yeah. I think it's very hard to screen that off from your thinking about the, the so-called Z world. Yeah, I- I think another thing that's going on is uh, people are kind of risk averse about these things and having a welfare level that's so close to zero, that's so close to like easily becoming negative uh, feels like pretty unappealing that you want to have mm-hmm. a buffer between yeah your welfare level and, and a life that would be uh, worse than not being not being alive. Uh, yeah, that might well be part of it also. 
Yeah. Um, is, is there any way that you want to get people to imagine like what a life uh, a life just worth living looks like that is more appealing than perhaps what they <laughs> what they imagine when they're feeling like the repugnant conclusion is repugnant? Uh, well, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. In fact, there are there are interestingly different types of thing that would count as a life barely worth living. Um, at least three interestingly different types, and it might make a big difference to somebody's intuitions about how bad the repugnant conclusion is, which one of these they have in mind. So the one that springs most easily to mind is kind of a very drab existence where you know you live for a normal length of time, maybe say eighty years, but at every point in time you're enjoying some mild pleasures. There's nothing special happening. There's nothing specially bad happening. Yeah. Um, Parfit uses the phrase muzak and potatoes, like you're listening to some really bad music and you have a kind of adequate but really boring diet and that's basically all that's going on in your life. Mm. Maybe you get some small pleasure from eating these potatoes, but it's not very much. Mm. So there's that kind of drab life. A completely different thing that might count as a life barely worth living is an extremely short life. Mm. So suppose you live a life that's pretty good while it lasts, but it only lasts for one second. Mm. Well, then you haven't got time to clock up very much goodness in your life. So that's mm. probably barely worth living. Um, or alternatively, you could live a life of massive ups and downs. So mm. lots of absolutely amazing, fantastic things, lots of absolutely terrible, painful, torturous things. And then the balance between these two could work out so that the net sum is just positive. Uh, that would also count as a life barely worth living. And it's not clear that how repugnant the repugnant conclusion is is the same for those three very different ways of thinking about what these barely worth living lives actually amount to. Actually, just like what about just like a normal human life where there's like normal ups and downs, but like they're kind of finely balanced, but like the, the positives kind of just barely outweigh the negatives. Like I would say like many people feel like their welfare level overall is like fairly close to zero, but like, you know, mildly positive. But it, but it has it has like all of the kind of the richness that that people associate with a normal human life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, maybe you're suggesting like actually quite a lot of us are in a predicament that's pretty mm. much that third one. I, yeah. I suggest. <laughs> I, it's yeah. sort of, I just think it, sort like, of feel those people are maybe not giving the positives their due. I mean, this sure. might be a matter of temperament how you assess that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I just think once you start talking about like uh, you know torture uh, in your life, then I think like it brings in kind of other moral intuitions about uh, like how very bad experiences might be very hard hard to outweigh. Um, right. but then it, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a fair comment um, but then just like a no, yeah, normal human life I mean yeah I think like many people probably have like very high welfare but some people are going to be negative and some people are going to be close to zero uh, on this kind of mm. yeah consequentialist view okay cool um, so uh, we've kind of canvassed like the, the the main theories within population ethics uh, that, that people give credence to uh, but it seems like given that like philosophy is fairly divided uh, across these um, we should be somewhat uncertain ourselves and kind of moral uncertainty is one thing that you've looked into a lot you were talking earlier about kind of the parliamentary view of how you weigh up different theories given different credences attached to them what do you think like we ought to do in practice given that we're kind of uncertain between these different theories and potentially like other theories that we haven't even yet thought of that might be more appealing I think there are two sensible things one can do here, not not mutually exclusive. One is to find situations where there's a lot more at stake according to one theory than there is according to another theory. So in extreme in an extreme case, you might find a situation where some theories say A, B, and C are equally good, and the other theories say A is much better than B and C. Mm. Then that seems like a situation where under uncertainty, you should do A mm. rather than B or C, even though it might be that there's nothing to choose. Yeah, it might be there's nothing to choose, but it might be that A was the right thing to do. So let's go with A. Mm. In a more controversial example of that, if you've got a situation where some theories say B is a little bit better than A, but it doesn't really matter. And the other theories say A is massively better than B. That also seems like a situation where, depending on how the credences pan out and so forth, under uncertainty, it's appropriate to go with A. Um, so that's one kind of thing you can do. Another kind of thing you can do is, I mean, this depends on the extent to which you get to choose your decision problem. But if you can find decision situations where there's basically unanimity across moral theories, then those are the easy cases. And even under uncertainty, we at least know what to do in those cases. I mean, these are kind of all the easy cases. And I think there are just unavoidably going to be much more problematic cases where what it's appropriate to do under moral uncertainty is going to depend more sensitively on issues about how to handle moral uncertainty that are themselves controversial. So, you know, I've given, I've given you the easy ones, but I'm not denying that there are also harder ones. Yeah. So I guess to bring it back to long-termism, which is uh, where we started, there's like, some theories under which long-termism is uh, exactly right and like a very important consideration and other ones under which it's like not Im the long term isn't important, but it's also probably not bad to work on, except in as much as you neglect mm -hmm. the present. And I guess uh, 
in that case, it sounds like you're saying, well, you would still, you would give a lot of weight to the long term uh, because it's like either positive or neutral. But I, I suppose like there, there could be other theories under which long termism is, is like actively bad. And, and in that case, they kind of cancel out and get into a more difficult case of how you would like what, what comes out of a moral uncertainty approach. Yeah, I think actually the, the so-called easy case is harder than that gloss gives it credit for maybe okay. because it's not enough to establish that under uncertainty, the long term is a good thing to work on. Um, as we know very well, we've got resource constraints and it's a competition. Right. So what yeah. we actually need to know it's is whether balance. it's better under yeah. uncertainty to work on long termism than it is to work on, say, global poverty. Mm. Um, and there, I think there's an interesting and open question of how theory sensitive the answer to this question is. So one of the things we'd like to do at GPI is devote a lot more attention to um, the question of what your views on long termism are likely to be if you deviate from the classical constellation of like stereotypical utilitarian views in one way or another. So if you think we should discount future welfare or if you think that the right theory of population ethics is other than total utilitarianism. Or you care about um, justice or fairness. Yeah, for example, like how, how many such deviations do you have to make before you will be in practice in the world as we find it led away from the conclusion that inference on the long term is the dominant factor for like morally laudatory decision making? Okay, so another philosophical issue that I know you've looked into is the problem of um, moral cluelessness. Um, I, I spoke about that with, with Amanda Askell um, a couple of ep- episodes back, uh, and she described it as this this problem where you know that you're going to have big like morally important effects on the long-term future but you don't have any idea uh what they are whether they're going to be like very positive or very negative and maybe also that it's uh very difficult to uh, figure out uh, what what effects what what they're going to be and what value they have is that a good way of summarizing the the problem of, of cluelessness it's a good first pass i think the important issues are a bit more subtle than that because if the problem was just we don't know what the effects are going to be then we haven't said enough to see why it's not an adequate answer to just say, yeah, sure, there's uncertainty, so do expected value theory and there's your answer. When I was thinking about cluelessness, I was worrying about things that wouldn't adequately be answered by saying, well, expected value theory is the way I deal with uncertainty. So those are cases where it's not just that you know that there are going to be large effects of what you do now in the far future and you don't know what those effects are going to be. It's furthermore that you know there are going to be large effects in the far future. You think there's a good reason to think they're even going to dominate the expected value calculation, but because it's unclear what your credences should be, Hmm. it's unclear whether the way in which they should dominate your expected value calculation is to massively favour doing A or instead to massively favour doing B. Those are cases where I think even once one's internalised the lessons of expected utility theory for decision-making, you can still feel paralysed in practical decisions. And I got interested in this because I think that effective altruists in particular face this predicament quite a lot in deciding, for example, whether to fund malaria nets or deworming, or indeed whether to fund either of those things at all. Yeah. Okay. So the problem is not just that we don't know what they are, but that we we don't have like any sensible way as far as we can see to to attach probabilities to these different outcomes yeah roughly so it's more of an epistemic issue that's right so so how is how is the epistemic situation here like any different from what we face just just all the time what why is it that it's hard to like give uh, sensible credences um in this in this situation but not in others is it because we like don't get any feedback uh, on like what, what impacts we're having are you contrasting say effective altruist decision making with more personal prudential decision making or what's what's the contrast you have in mind i guess i'm just trying to figure out uh like why do we have this the, yeah the problem of cluelessness uh with like long-termism but not in in other cases uh, i'm trying to get like what what's the core of the issue of like the difficulty forming like proper credences so uh, maybe i should talk through a bit what seemed to me the relevant contrast between the cases where i think Lots of people have worried that there is a problem, but actually I think there's no problem on the okay. one hand. Yeah. And the cases where even I think there's a problem on okay, the other yeah, hand. Okay, yeah, yeah. We'll walk us through that. Sure. Okay, so here are some cases where some people have argued there's a problem, but I ended up thinking there isn't really. Each of our actions, even our most trivial actions, like clicking a finger or deciding whether to cross a road, is going to have significant effects on the far future in ways that we're completely unable to predict. Um, this is the the case for that claim is most persuasively made, I think, by noting that even our most trivial actions affect the identities of future people. So if I decide to say, I don't know, throw a tennis ball across the street in the path of an oncoming car or help an old lady across a road versus not do those things, 
I'm going to buy a number of mundane causal processes, I'm going to affect which people exist in the future. Why is that? Well, it's because of the extreme sensitivity of who exists in the future on things like the precise timing of conceptions and things like that. So if I decide to help somebody across the road, um, then I slightly change the timing of everything else that person does in, during their day, including slightly changing the timing of the interactions that that person has with all the other pers all, the, all the other people that they may or may not uh, meet during the rest of their day. And eventually these causal uh, links are going to reach out to people who are destined to conceive a child on the day in question. And if I make it the case that that child is conceived a few fractions of a second earlier or later, then I change the identity of which child gets conceived. And therefore, downstream, now looking forward to that future child's life, uh, my choosing to help the person cross the road or not um, has made the difference between all the things that the actual child does in their life and all the things that the merely possible child who didn't in fact exist because of what I decided to do would have done in their life if they had existed. So that's the basic case for thinking that even in the case of the most trivial actions like throwing a tennis ball or helping someone to cross the road, in objective terms, the actual effects of my actions consist much more in the completely unpredictable far future effects than they do consist in the predictable near term intended effects of the action. OK, so some people think that herein lies a problem that leads to something like decision paralysis, because now if I'm trying to decide what to do based on what's going to have the best consequences, it looks like I'm completely clueless about what's going to have the best consequences. So. My view is that when the dust settles from that aspect of the debate, we see in the end that there's not really a problem because if your credences behave sensibly, according to me, regarding these completely un unpredictable future effects, then when you do your expected value theory, the mere possibility that you might make things better in these completely unpredictable ways is just more or less precisely cancelled out by the equally plausible mere possibility that you might make things worse in equally unpredictable ways. So those are cases where I think there isn't, in the end, any practical real world problem for real decision making. But I think things are different where we're not talking about the mere possibility that by something like some chaotic mechanism we might turn out to make things better. Um, and the mere possibility that by some equally unpredictable chaotic mechanism we might turn out to make things make things worse. If we're instead talking about a decision setting where there are some highly structured systematic reasons for thinking there might be a general tendency of my action to make things better, but there might also for some other reasons be a general tendency to make things worse, then I don't think you get this kind of precise cancelling that gives you a license to just ignore the unforeseeable effects when you do your expected value calculations. So what kind of decision situations are we talking about here? I'm not talking about the effects of helping somebody to cross the road on the identity of future children. I'm talking about things like the more or less guessable downstream knock-on effects of, say, funding anti-malarial bed nets. Um, so you might worry about, okay, I know that the immediate effects of funding bed nets are positive. I know that I'm going to improve lives, I'm going to save lives, but I also know that there are going to be further downstream effects of that and also side effects of my intervention. For example, influences on the size of future populations. Hmm. Um, well, it's notoriously unclear how to think about the value of future population size, whether it would be a good thing to increase population sizes in the short to medium term in the end, or whether that would in the end be a bad thing. There are lots of uncertainties here, mm. but it's not a case where you could just say, well, clearly the credences should be 50-50. It's rather a case where there are really complex arguments on both sides, and it's unclear what credence you should assign to this or that claim at the end of the day. So that, that I think, ends up being a much more complicated situation where Things do not cancel out in expectation. Mm. It's unclear what credences you should have. But yet, whether you should do the action in question depends on this somewhat arbitrary decision it feels like we're forced to make about precisely what credences to have. Yeah, okay. That helps to explain it quite a bit. Uh, the reason I wanted to raise it again is I think some people didn't quite understand uh, yeah, why there was a philosophically interesting uh, point here after the conversation with Amanda, because they, they were thinking, mm. well, in the second case, you can still just kind of just maximize the expectation, do the thing that seems best on balance. Well, yeah, what, what, yeah, we what, could do that if you've got precise credences, but we're yeah. talking about decision situations where either it's not clear what credences you should have, and yet what you do depends on what credences you choose to have. Or perhaps we might be talking about a situation where it's inappropriate to have precise credences. Mm. The epistemically appropriate thing might be to have somewhat imprecise credences, but with a range of imprecision 
that encompasses <laughs> credences that would tell you to do A and also encompasses credences that would tell you to do B. So some people might respond, some people might respond to this cluelessness worry by saying, I could just give to organizations that do good in the short term, something like, you know, against malaria foundation that saves lives now. And that's, I know that that's good today. And then in the long term, you know, does that work out positively or negatively? I don't, I don't have to say anything in particular about that. I can just say, well, maybe the good and the bad cancels out, but I don't have any reason to expect it to be bad. So um, the fact that it's like good in the short run is, is very appealing and seems like a, a less risky option. Uh, what, what do you have to say to that? Yeah. So I think this kind of picture is very natural and I think it informs a lot of people's actual EA donation behavior, including in the past informed my own donation behavior. But I think it's precisely because I came to the view that this picture is really importantly misleading. That's really why I started working on cluelessness. Mm. So what I now think about this is, yeah, what the standard, uh, say, EA charity evaluations are doing is measuring and quantifying, researching those short-term, more immediate effects of the intervention. So, for example, if you look at the evaluations that GiveWell does um, for, say, the Against Malaria Foundation, those evaluations talk about how many lives are saved by in, in the short term, how many lives are saved by distributing bed nets. Um, so far, so good. But the lines of thought we've been going through in talking about cluelessness according to me, have convinced us that when you take the long-term perspective and you take seriously the thought that what you're ultimately interested in is all of the effects that your actions will have and not just the ones that are nearer in time or easier to measure, actually the total effect of your intervention will be massively dominated by the unforeseen ones. So that bit that you've actually measured in your impact evaluation, we know is going to be massively dominated by the things that you haven't included in your impact evaluation. Whether the eventual story ends up being that the sign is still the same, hmm. so it's still a good intervention, but the vast majority of the reason why it's a good intervention is in the stuff that you haven't measured. Hmm. Or the other scenario, it ends up being an evaluation that's net bad hmm. um, because the stuff that you haven't measured on balance points massively in the other direction. Now, we don't know which of those things is, is the case. Um, the hypothesis that you mentioned, which, if true, would justify basing donation behavior very closely on the impact evaluations, is the hypothesis that the stuff that we haven't measured precisely cancels itself out, mm. at least an expectation. But the problem is there's that's really quite implausible. There's precisely no reason for thinking there's going to be that very convenient cancelling out. So really the situation is there's one thing that we have measured. We know pretty much its magnitude. We know its sign. There's a load of stuff we haven't mentioned, we haven't measured, which is going to make a big difference to the overall equation and really could go either way. So I think really your your properly considered EO donation behaviour should be almost entirely driven by what your best guess is about that stuff that we haven't measured. And if that's so, then there doesn't really seem to be any place in the picture for the impact evaluations that we have. Unless you think something like, well, the vast majority of the expected value at least goes by causal chains that go via this life-saving behavior. So we can use that as a proxy. Um, yeah. You might try to rescue the importance of the impact evaluations we've got in that kind of way. And I don't think that's completely unreasonable. But I also don't think it's a foregone conclusion that the vast majority of the, um, the impact goes causally via this. And if it does, there's still a lot of open questions about what the eventual sign is. Hmm. So Yeah, I think a lot of people would, would have this intuition that although... So kind of I've got my best guess about the long term effects and I've got like my best guess about the short term effects and I know so much more about the short term effects that that's just what I want to give weight to and my best guess about the long term effects I should just ignore because there's kind of no signal there. But you're just saying but because it, it, like the, the amount of importance of, of that question is so much larger even relative to your ignorance that uh, it's it's still a very important part of the, the decision making process. Yeah, right. I'm saying something like that. I mean, normally when we're being rational, the way we think that we should deal with uncertainty is by doing following expected value. Hmm. So, 
yeah, there's all this stuff that we don't know about. What do we do about that? Well, we figure out what our credences ought to be about the stuff that we don't know about. And then we implicitly or explicitly do the expected value calculation. In this case, the problem we have is that it's really unclear what our credences ought to be about all the important, quote, unforeseeable stuff, mm. the stuff that we don't measure in the impact evaluations. But what we should do and how we should prioritise our donation behaviour, how we should prioritise one intervention against other interventions and which interventions we even count as being good versus bad in expectation depends potentially quite sensitively on those thorny questions about what the rational credences are in this space. So there's a whole lot of people who are who are basing their charitable giving now on uh, kind of the measurable uh, near-term effects of their actions. What kind of advice do you have to give to them, if, if any, on the basis of this, this kind of philosophy? Sure, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, maybe I should say up front, um, I'm also one of those people. I do, in <laughs> fact, base my own decisions on gives, what give wells recommendations. Okay, so clearly I don't think it's completely crazy behavior. What do I think is the best way of defending that behavior? I think for that kind of behavior to make sense, once you've taken on board worries about cluelessness, you have to be making a judgment call that in the long run, the um, the net effect of this intervention, both like most of the, the most of the important effects of this intervention in expectation go via a causal chain that at least proceeds via the thing that the GiveWell impact evaluation is focusing on. So in this case, it proceeds via lives saved in the short term, rather than being some kind of side effect that doesn't even go through that route. You have to think that in order to think that this calculation quantifying how many lives get saved is any kind of important guide to what's going on with the overall grand calculation that we're implicitly trying to do. Um, and secondly, you have to think that the sign of the value of this intervention would be preserved if you did the grand calculation rather than just the very near term effect. So you you have to be deciding against hypotheses that say things like, oh yeah, saving lives is positive value in the short term, but in the longer term, my view is on balance that saving lives is, say, bad because it increases population and the world's overpopulated anyway. So on balance, things that increase population are net negative. If you have a view like that, then I don't think you should take GiveWell's calculations as a direct guide to your donation behavior. If anything, you'd want to do something like <laughs> pick the intervention that saves the fewest lives. <laughs> you know, that, like, that should be more straightforward, I guess. That road, but you can see where this is going. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, I think there are defensible views that have a central place in them for using the GiveWell recommendations and calculations, but that we should have our eyes open to the fact that we need to make or are implicitly making those not completely obvious judgment calls when we're doing that. The other thing that I think has changed for me through worrying a lot about this cluelessness stuff is that I have much less confidence now than I used to about um, how well placed I am to make cross-cause comparisons on the basis of calculations like GiveWells. So I used to think, okay, suppose I'm comparing against Malaria Foundation to some other charity that's, that imp uh, reduces animal suffering by a quantified amount. Um, I used to think I could just make my judgment calls about how important I thought saving one human life was versus reducing the amount of animal suffering by one cow year and then do the trade-off between these two charities appropriately. I no longer think I'm in any position to do that, or at least to do that by those means, because if I'm thinking of the number of lives saved by AMF calculation as just a proxy for the amount of value that's being generated in the long run by funding AMF, knowing how to how to trade off one life, one human life saved against one animal year of suffering, doesn't help me to make the comparison between these two charities. I would have to also have some um, hypothesis in place about what the correlation is between one human life saved in the short term and how many units of value there are in expected terms in the grand AMF calculation, like the big one that takes into account all the unforeseen effects and tries to average over the credences yeah. before I'd be in any position to do the cross-cause prioritization. Um, so it's made me a lot more uh, modest, maybe, or something like that, about the value of these impact evaluations in the cross-cause arena. Okay, so so what's the cutting edge on this problem? Uh, are, we, are we any closer to a solution than, than when we conceived of it? Not as far as I know, but I mean, I wrote my paper on this maybe a year or so ago, so it was quite recent for me. Um, there hasn't been very much time in, on academic timescales 
yeah. shown massive subsequent progress since then. I think Amanda Askell's work on this is very interesting. I know she's mm. been thinking a lot about the value of information and how that will plug into this debate, but I guess you already talked about that stuff with her. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, do you, do you think we're probably just going to have to muddle through and make our best guesses about what the yeah what what the effects of our actions will be? Basically, yes. I think we're just in a very uncomfortable situation where what you should do in expected value terms depends with annoying sensitivity or with unfortunate sensitivity on what feels like a pretty arbitrary, unguided choice about how you choose to settle your credences in these regions where rigorous argument doesn't give you very much guidance. So I think it's just, I mean, maybe in the end, the discussion just highlights the value and the unavoidableness of slightly more flying by the seat of your pants reasoning where you have to make a practical decision and the scientists haven't told you exactly what the answer is. So Mm. sorry, you have to rely on sensible judgment and just hope that it's sensible rather than not sensible. So yeah, on on this uh, topic of kind of having to go with with your gut a bit, um, there's quite a lot of people over the years who've cited risk aversion about their impact as, as an argument against focusing on, on the very long-term future. But I, I've heard that um, a bunch of you at, at GPI have been looking into that. And uh, when you try to formalize that, it seems like uh, you, could, you can make the argument that risk aversion is a reason to, to be more favorable to work on, on the long-term. Can, can you discuss the, the problem there and, and um, how you reach that somewhat counterintuitive uh, conclusion? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it is a counterintuitive. Well, I hope it's not a counterintuitive conclusion once you've thought through the reasoning a bit more carefully. I think to get the idea that risk aversion is a reason not to work on the long run future, whether or not that's going to follow is going to depend on what you're risk averse with respect to. Hmm. So if you think I'm risk averse with respect to the difference that I make, so I really want to be certain that I, in fact, make a difference to how how well the world goes, then it's going to be a really bad idea by your lights to work on extinction risk mitigation. Because look, either the world, either the humanity is going to go extinct prematurely or it isn't. Mm. What's the chance that your contribution to mm. the mitigation effort turns out to tip the balance? Well, it's minuscule. Mm. Um, so if you really want to do something in even the rough ballpark of maximize the probability that you make some difference, then don't work on extinction risk mitigation. But that that line of reasoning only makes sense if the thing you were risk averse with respect to was the difference that you make to how well how well the world goes. Yeah. What we normally mean when we talk about risk aversion is something different. It's not risk aversion with respect to the difference I make, it's risk aversion with respect to something like how much value there is in the universe. And if you're risk averse in that sense, then you place more emphasis on avoiding very bad outcomes than somebody who is risk neutral. So it's not at all counterintuitive then, I I would have thought, to see that you're going to be more pro-extinction risk mitigation. Yeah, okay. Because extinction would be such a big shift uh, in in the value that preventing that uh, is, is like reducing the variability of the of the potential outcomes. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, the argument doesn't even require noting that there's a big difference in value between premature extinction and no premature extinction. It just requires noting that premature extinction is the worst out- is the worst of the two outcomes. So risk aversion is going to tip you mm. in the direction of putting more effort into avoiding that worst outcome. Yeah. I, I almost want to push back and say, even if you are focused on the very, like, yeah, you want to reduce the, the variance on the impact that you have, uh, morally speaking, that it's not clear that working on extinction risk isn't the same or like less risky than working on, say, economic development. Because it feels like people want to say, oh, well, you know, um, saving lives through bed nets is less risky because I'm, I know that I'm kind of going to bank the, the initial impact of saving like someone's life. Uh, which is quite measurable. But then, of course, in the actual impact in the long term is still extremely variable because we have to think about what are, what is the long term like effect of that action going to be. Um, and it's, in a sense, that's that's like no more predictable, maybe even it's less predictable than the impact of trying to reduce um, the risk of, of extinction. Yeah, that makes sense. The, the reason I raise this is that I think that the people who I've met who are worried about risk aversion do seem to be worried about, yeah, this um, reducing the, the variance or the uncertainty about their personal impact. Okay, so... Now I'm sort of making things up as I go along. But so what's the picture in the minds of these people? Is it, well, I'm risk averse. (laughs) Here's a a way I can imagine this line of thought going. I don't think it's the one you're referring to, though. Mm. But here's here's a version of it. I'm risk averse with respect to the difference I make. Mm. I want to, so I want to reduce the uh, variance in the possible differences I make across states of nature. And so I favor working on extinction risk mitigation because I can be pretty sure I'm going to have no impact. (laughs) Right, right. I mean, there's a small chance I'll have this massive impact, but it's overwhelmingly likely. 
I see. Well, yeah. I've no impact. Now, on okay. some measures, that's a lot of constancy across states of nature. So a risk yeah. averse person should really like that. Yeah. Whereas if they do something, yeah, you see where I'm going. Yeah, no. I, I mean, that's not supposed to be the No, that's, that's not quite it. I think... <laughs> um, I think it's that they want to have a positive impact, but they regard they kind of think that there's like declining returns maybe to like having more and more positive impacts. So they want to have like a high level of confidence of having like a small positive impact over like a tiny probability of having like a much larger impact. Um, I think I, th- I think I think that's the intuition. So what do these people think about um, say funding bed nets? Tell me again. They think that this is good by risk aversion lights or this is yeah, bad by risk aversion lights? I think the, the argument is typically made that this is an argument in favor of doing something that has like positive near-term effects like saving lives uh, because you have like a high level of confidence that this at least in the short run will have like a positive effect and then the long-term effect well that just all kind of cancels out and we're just going to ignore that and say that well because we have a high degree of confidence in this like positive short-run impact that that's like good by risk aversion perspective. Okay so I guess you won't be surprised since you know my work on cluelessness, you won't be yeah. surprised to hear that that sounds like a dubious line of reasoning to me. That you, we can't just ignore the long run effects. Yeah. In the malaria net case, you need to actually can be committed to a view that the long run stuff is going to cancel out to run that line of argument. But I don't think there's any reason to think that to it think will. The long run stuff is going to cancel out. I mean, it's very unclear what it is going to do, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to cancel out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's right. Like, if, if you do throw the long-term effects back in there, then it, it seems like both of these have, or like working on extinction risk versus uh, working on saving lives, both have like huge and uncertain like long-term effects. And the difference in like uh, the riskiness of these two different actions is pretty small. It's, it's, it's only a drop in the bucket. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, I think in simple models of this, we try to kind of pretend that the impact of working on, say, global poverty is known. But as you rightly point out, it isn't actually. Yeah. So a more realistic model would have to take that into account. So in talking about moral uncertainty earlier with population ethics, you, you talked about this approach um, to dealing with it, known as the kind of parliamentary approach, where you imagine kind of that you have politicians elected to represent these different moral perspectives. And the number of them in the parliament is in some sense proportional to, to the credences that you give to different theories. And then they kind of debate and like trade among themselves. Do you want to explain like what's what's appealing about that approach um, as opposed to maybe just, just like maximizing the expected value where you kind of have credences across different different values that you might place on different outcomes, given the different moral theories? So, yeah, the standard way people in the literature have tended to think about the problem of appropriate action under moral uncertainty is basically to just help themselves off the shelf to the standard way of thinking about action under uncertainty in general, that is, maximise some conception of value. So in the case of moral uncertainty, this would mean you have each of your candidate moral theories, the ones you have non-zero credence in, have each of those moral theories assign moral values to the various outcomes, how morally good or bad they are, um, and have write down your credences and the various theories, maybe have credence one half in one theory, credence 0.3 in one, and credence 0.2 in the third one, and then you just maximise the expectation value of moral value according to your credences in these theories. So that's the standard approach. Then there are various things people don't like, or at least some people don't like, about that approach. One is that it doesn't give you well-defined answers unless you have a well-defined notion of inter-theoretic comparison of values. So there has to be a fact of the matter about, say, how important moral theory one says the difference between A and B is compared to how important theory two says the difference between A and B is. And some people have been sceptical that that kind of inter-theoretic comparison of value difference can make any sense. Because look, theory one isn't going to tell you anything about how important it thinks this is compared to what theory two thinks. And neither is theory two. So whatever the true moral theory is, the true moral theory is not going to give you inter-theoretic comparisons. And so many people have worried that there's no other place for them to come from. Mm. So, so that's one reason people don't like maximizing expected moral value as an approach to moral uncertainty. A second reason is that some moral theories are structurally not amenable to treatment by this approach. So in order to maximize expected value, you have to have each of the moral theories you have non-zero credence in basically having a numerical representation. So it has to be mathematically well behaved. It can't do things like say that there are cycles of betterness. A is better than B is better than C is better than A. And most people have very low credence in theories that are structurally awkward in that sense. But there are cogent philosophical defences of them out there in the moral philosophy literature. Some people are sympathetic to these theories, despite having thought about it a lot. And so it seems like if you're even slightly epistemically humble, then you should at least have non-zero credence in these maybe a little bit wacky, structurally awkward theories. 
And then the problem is you just can't handle that within a maximized expected moral value approach to moral uncertainty. As soon as you've got non-zero credence in some theory, you have to have it being mathematically well-defined in the sense of numerically representable. Otherwise, the maximization of expected moral value formula just can't deal with it. Mm. So there's been this desire for an approach to moral uncertainty that has a broader tent of theories that it can handle. And then thirdly, there are some decision situations where under moral uncertainty, intuitively, it feels like you want to hedge your bets and choose an option that's kind of maybe halfway between the thing that's recommended by one theory and the thing that's recommended by another theory. Mm. And again, there are the sort of structural reasons why you can't get that intuitive verdict from a maximization of expected um, moral value approach. So these have all been held up at various times as problems that people have hoped a parliamentary style model might be able to solve. But the parliamentary model, as far as I know to date, has not been made very precise. It's kind of often left at the level of this metaphor of, you know, the moral theories as mm. participants in a discussion. So what, what I was doing in my talk on this was just fleshing out one way, one sort of plausible looking way you might try to make the parliamentary model precise using tools from bargaining theory and then investigating at least under that way of making it precise, is it really true that it behaves better than the standard approach on the dimensions people had hoped that it did? Mm. Um, and does it? No. Okay. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's, it's, a difficult, it's difficult to know what lesson to take from that, because of mm. course, I don't have any proof that the particular way of making the vague idea precise that I worked with is the mm. best one. I it see. seemed the most natural one. It was the one that was easiest to formulate by taking existing tools off the shelf, like reading a bargaining theory textbook and applying standard ideas. Hmm. But it may be that there's some other way to make the basic intuitive idea of the parliamentary model precise that would lead to a theory that performs better. So that's kind of, as far as I know, where the research has got to at the moment. We've got one way of making it precise that looks like it leads to a not very promising theory. And I think that throws down the gauntlet to try and find some better way of making it precise or otherwise to just abandon the idea and accept that we have to live with the problems of the mm. maximised expected value approach. Yeah, so just thinking about uh, uh, the, the parliamentary uh, approach, it seems like what it's going to do is produce something like a Pareto optimum for the different theories, like compared to one another. It will produce something where like if a theory is made better off and the other and another theory isn't, uh, isn't made worse off, then you definitely get those trades being made. And I guess possibly yeah. in as much as like the theories themselves give, give themselves guidance as to how to trade off like different outcomes, then you'll get like some trades that are not, not Pareto improvements, but they are like improvements by the lights of those different theories. Um, mm -hmm. although oddly it seems like which which ones of those you'll get will depend on kind of which decisions are in are like being considered at any point in time because you can kind of mm -hmm. only trade between like different you know, choices and different actions that are like under consideration in a given situation so it like becomes very circumstantial like what what you prefer does, does that yeah i mean out? i'm not even sure that you get the pareto dominance principle you want actually on the mm -hmm. particular way of making it precise that i was dealing with so i was investigating what happens if you say okay we're going to pick the nash bargaining solution that that jargon will only make sense to people who know bargaining theory yeah. um, but anyway in that approach if you've got one or more theories that say don't care between two options but i guess to put the point in slightly more intuitive terms um, that theory has no incentive to agree to the Pareto dominating option. So that theory could just choose to be contrary and say, no, I'm not going to agree. I'm going to uh, flump for the <laughs> Pareto inferior one. Uh, so that's maybe kind of the intuitive reason why you might not even get Pareto dominance. Unless every theory thinks it's better, then mm. of course you'll get unanimous agreement. Yeah. But if it's just that some theory thinks it's better and no theory thinks it's worse then it's a little bit harder to get the result you want from a bargaining theory approach than it is from a decision theoretic approach. Okay, yeah. Are you optimistic about other people looking into this and trying to trying to improve it? I mean, do, do people do, do you think that this can be made like a theoretically like really appealing approach or is it kind of always going to be a hacky practical solution like given that we haven't found something that works better in principle? I don't think it's theoretically any messier than maximize expected moral value. Maximize expected moral value is already quite messy when you go into the details. Like if you want to actually apply it to a practical decision situation, and therefore you have to settle these issues of inter-theoretic comparisons, mm. the formulas you have to use to settle the inter-theoretic comparisons are pretty messy in practical contexts. Um, and the bargaining theory approach that I was looking into also ends up being messy, but in very similar ways. Mm. And I think that as far as messiness goes and hackiness, uh, theoretical niceness 
they pretty much tell the same story. They kind of look relatively well-defined and neat and pretty at an abstract level, and then they get messy when you try to apply them in practice. Because you end up have, in, in both cases, you end up having to do things like write down exactly what you meant by the set of all options, while precisely how broad was that supposed to be? <laughs> uh, and then in addition to that, you have to write down a privileged measure on that set of all options. Well, where did you get that measure from? Yeah. There's like no mathematically clean formula for telling you which is the right measure, but it's going to make a difference to the eventual recommendation. So are they, the, the, those are the kind of very messy issues I was alluding to that make things messy when you try to apply it in practice, but you face them on both kinds of approaches. So I think yeah, they're, they're basically on a par as messiness goes. So I know it's, a, it's super early days that uh, GPI has kind of only existed for a year, but uh, are there any areas where your research has caused you to, to change your mind? I think it's just super early days. I mean, don't remember the the timescales that academics yeah. tend to work on, or at least us. You know, you you spend a few months fleshing out the vague idea that might in the future constitute a research program, yeah. and then you spend a few months working out what's going to go in the paper, yeah. and that's about where we've got to because we're super <laughs> early days. So yeah, I mean, hopefully, ask us in a year or two's time, then I'll be able to say, yeah, I've changed my mind on the following practically important issues because of research we've done here, but it it, it takes longer than eight months. Okay, uh, let's move on to talking about Global Priorities Institute itself and then how people could potentially end up working at GPI or other related organizations. How is effective altruism and global priorities research seen by other academic philosophers and economists these days? That's a good question. I think the answer in philosophy is probably quite different from the answer in economics. In philosophy, the picture is already reasonably positive. A lot of very good moral philosophers are at least sympathetic to the basic ideas of effective altruism. And quite a lot of them, especially younger ones, are devoting significant amounts of their research time. Well, they're either already devoting significant amounts of their research time to research questions motivated by effective altruist type concerns, or they're sympathetic in principle to doing so, and they only need relatively little encouragement. In economics, we've found it much harder to find people, certainly people who are already doing that, or even people who sound like they're willing to do it anytime soon, perhaps partly because economics seems to be perhaps particularly cutthroat in terms of the pressure to publish Mm. and the norms within the discipline about what kind of thing the journals are willing to publish. So I think in the case of economics, people have to have a much stronger motivation coming from their effective altruist commitment and corresponding willingness to go against the career incentives in order to work in this space than their counterparts would in philosophy. Yeah. But intellectually, are they, are they, are they sympathetic or, or do people think that it's wrong-headed in some way? I think in both disciplines, you have the whole spectrum of views. I mean, in moral philosophers, you have a lot of people who are extremely pro and a lot of people who are extremely anti in some sense. Um, well, I say anti in some sense, because if you're just saying this will be a good thing to do, then they say, well, that's kind of so trivially true that it's not even worth discussing. But if you start saying there's some kind of moral obligation to behave in this way, then that puts a lot of backs up. Uh, similarly, in economics, I think there are quite a few people, perhaps mostly the younger crowd, who are very sympathetic and there are also quite a lot of people who think this is all terribly naive. So for, for whatever reason, in both disciplines, it seems to be quite a polarizing topic. If you start mentioning effective altruism, you can get people like going to each side of the wall in a room quite quickly. Are there any, any really common uh, misconceptions or objections that you find yourself having to explain again and again? Yeah. Um, What's on the list of those? Well, on the moral philosophy side, which is obviously the side that I'm personally more familiar with, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about the connection between effective altruism, either between effective altruism and utilitarianism specifically, or between effective altruism and consequentialism more generally, where the misconception is that effective altruism is only a thing that you would be either interested in or motivated to pursue if you were a utilitarian slash if you were a consequentialist. I think in reality, the situation is that if you do assume consequentialism in general or utilitarianism in particular, then there's a particularly simple story you can tell about the status of the effective altruist project. But the view that this is something that only has anything to be said for it against the background of, say, utilitarian philosophy is completely unfounded. All, All you really need is 
some component of your moral philosophy which acknowledges that making the world a better place is a worthwhile thing to do um, and that's really all you need to get the effective altruist projects off the ground. Um, maybe relatedly another misconception I think some people have in moral philosophy is that effective altruists are strongly committed to um, very strong claims about the status of effective altruist activities as something that is a moral obligation to engage in. Whereas I think in the minds of many people who would self-identify as part of the effective altruist movement, they're not even really thinking in terms of moral obligation at all. Um, they're just thinking, this is clearly a worthwhile thing to do. This is a thing I want to do. I choose to make this project a central part of my life. Now let's get on with doing it. Let's not start talking about whether there are moral laws saying I have to or not. So th those will be a couple of examples. Yeah. So, yeah, what, what has GPI been doing to kind of steer people towards more global priorities, uh, relevant topics, and, and how much how much success have you managed to have so far? Yeah, it's very early days to try and assess how much success we're having about steering other people towards them. I can say a little bit about what our strategy has been and what kind of things we've been working on. I mean, one thing that we'd like to do is steer the discussion in moral philosophy away from these questions, which to our mind are somewhat over-discussed about, well, is there really a moral obligation to try and maximise the good? Or is there for some other reason a moral obligation to do effective altruist type stuff? And to focus more on what you might think of as being the internal effective altruist questions, which are more of the character of, okay, I buy into the effective altruist worldview. I think this is a worthwhile thing to be trying to do. I'm interested in devoting a significant part of my resources, whether those resources are time or intellectual energy or money or whatever, to trying to make the world a better place. What non-trivial questions do I then face that tools from philosophy might be able to help with? Um, and what are the answers to those questions? So what we've been doing so far is engaging in research in that kind of space. So just sort of assuming that effective altruism is an interesting thing to do and then thinking through how it actually goes and not even really talking about whether this is the thing that everybody should feel morally obliged to do or not. Yeah. So kind of trying to open up a, a new field of research by researching on the questions that seem to us under-researched and important and then hoping that in due course other people will join in with that. It seems like part of GPI's theory of change is that there will be a lot of value generated if we can take um, ideas that we think we kind of know and understand but have never really written up properly uh, and try to make them, try to formalize them and write them up in you know, proper papers and publish them and, and uh, see if they can withstand all the critiques that people throw at them. Um, how, how confident are you that it's, it's worth going, going through that, that process? Because I know some people are somewhat skeptical about the value of publishing ideas that you think you've already had because the process just takes so long and it slows you down from having new ideas. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a good concern to have. Um, maybe I should say papers of that character are only one half of what GPI is trying to do. Not necessarily one half in quantitative terms. I don't know like what proportion of our papers will end up having that character versus the other character. But I'd like to flag the other character anyway. Yeah. The other character is we also think there are a lot of questions where we are really genuinely quite radically unsure what the answer is and we want to try and find out that answer via this process of careful discussion. Mm. But anyway, going back to your question about the first type of paper, what's the value of that, that type of paper? One thing is that at the moment, it's true that a lot of university students, including extremely smart university students, come across effective altruist ideas one way or another. But it's interesting that they mostly come across it via things like websites or discussions in the pub or student societies that they happen to join. They generally don't come across it at the moment via their academic studies. Why is that? Well, part of the reason for that is that when university lecturers are designing academic syllabuses, they do so on the basis of what there's a decent academic literature on. And at the moment, there really isn't an academic literature uh, properly writing up and investigating these questions that by the lights of effective altruism are extremely important. Now, you might think, well, that doesn't really matter if the smarter students are coming across the ideas anyway by some other means. But I think the reality is, firstly, only a relatively small proportion of the students are coming across them compared to what could be achievable if these things are actually being taught in undergraduate courses. And secondly, of those who do come across the ideas, a significant proportion of them reject the ideas, whereas we think, since we think the ideas are good ones, we think that if there was a more rigorous treatment of the ideas, that more people would be won over to what, according to us, is, is the correct way of thinking about things. So it's kind of a strategy of 
getting effective altruist ideas to be taken more seriously and acted upon more widely in, for example, the next generation of world leaders via bringing it about that the next generation of world leaders comes across these ideas and in a way that makes them more likely to take them seriously during their university studies. What's your sense of the uh, of, of how influential academia uh, is in general? I know quite a lot of people think that, um, at least in the UK, uh, you know, academics at some of the top universities have have a really large influence over government decision making, like perhaps a surprising amount of influence. Does that does that fit with your experience? Yeah, I think that's particularly true in economics, more so in economics than in philosophy, which is one of the reasons why GPI is particularly interested in like building up the economic side of the, the literature on EA relevant ideas. But yeah, in general, I mean, there are these two routes for academics to have influence, right? One is the direct route. So if the government is considering doing something or some other entity is considering doing something, one key part of their process is going to be consulting with the experts. And the experts can mean a lot of things, but one type of thing it often means is let's ask the academic at the leading universities who are working on things related to this, both what their own views are and what their literature says about this thing. And then there's the indirect route I mentioned um, earlier, right? You're sort of influencing the influencers. So on a longer time scale, academics have influence because academics have a captive audience in the brightest young minds of the next generation. What's the longer term vision for global priorities research in, in academia? Uh, if, if things go really well over the next 10, 20 or 30 years, like how do you think it will look? I think there will be significantly more attention paid in the academic research space to research questions that are both extremely important by effective altruist light. So, for instance, questions that are relevant to cause prioritization decisions, um, but questions where at the moment there's really no academic literature on it. So we'd like to see many more journal articles um, focusing on these things, much a much higher proportion of the brain power that exists within academia focused on these extremely important topics rather than on the, you know, perhaps intellectually cleaner but less practically important topics that there's focus on at the moment. And then correspondingly, topics that are of central importance for important large-scale real-world decision-making, those topics being much better represented on undergraduate and graduate university syllabuses than they are at the moment. Yeah, so a number of people who've worked at GPI have said that it's quite different from other academic uh, institutes, I guess especially in terms of philosophy, uh, in that it seems like you all work very closely together. Yeah, why, why are you doing things a little bit differently in that, in that respect, and is, is it paying off? Yeah, I think it is paying off. Why are we doing things a little bit differently? I think there's a somewhat unhelpful culture um, in philosophy, but probably in academia more generally, where to caricature it somewhat, what people are centrally trying to do is look really smart and impressive. That's kind of what the career incentives drive them towards. Where it, So that if you're in that mindset, you're, for example particularly concerned that this great new idea ends up being your paper. Whereas in the mindset we're trying to develop and conform to here, um, what we centrally want to happen is that these good ideas and these important questions get investigated and written up and published in the appropriate academic literature by somebody. And we're much less con- each of us is much less concerned that the person who writes any particular paper happens to be us. Um, so that kind of lends itself, that mindset lends itself quite naturally to a much more collaborative um, model of working. And what we've been doing is roughly first having some quite extensive initial group brainstorming ideas where we together, and th- th- over the last few months, this has been a group of perhaps four or so of us, uh, we together brainstorm a topic and think about where the literature currently is, what the existing effective altruist lines of thought are that seem either compelling or interesting and are conspicuously absent from the academic literature, where there might be potentially high value papers that one might try to write. And then once we've got a list of potential papers of that type, we might identify which member of our team is for whatever reason the best place to write an article on that thing, where who's best placed is some function of who has the most relevant existing expertise, who has the most available time, who has the most personal interest and excitement in writing on this thing, because that's an important part of being in a position to do successful research. Um, And then we make some kind of team decision about who's going to work on what over the next few months. And then also just in the process of writing the paper, there'll be a lot more 
team discussion involving maybe a lot of input from someone who isn't necessarily going to get their name ending up on the paper and nobody really cares and nobody in our team is really thinking about that. So I think all of this is is quite atypical um, and contrasts quite radically with at least what I've experienced working in academia outside of GPI. I guess so, so part of the reason is uh, that you're trying to be, I guess, more interdisciplinary or like share ideas between people working in different in different areas, right? I don't think that's the reason for that collaborative model. I think okay. it's something that's also true. But I mean, I've, I've done interdisciplinary work in the past. Um, I used to work in philosophy of physics, as it happens. So that was interdisciplinary philosophy and physics. I talked to physicists a lot. It was still very much the kind of lone scholar, everybody's oh. trying to look clever type model. So I think it's more about... Um, having a bunch of people who are bought into the EA mindset and are thinking the point is not for me to change the world, the point is for the world to get changed. Yeah. I think that's been really helpful in generating a more productive working style. Yeah, just, just on, the, on the interdisciplinary thing, there's this odd phenomenon that kind of everyone says how great interdisciplinary stuff is and yet it seems to be like very hard to get people to actually work in that way. Uh, and it makes me wonder if it's um, if it's the case that actually it's just something that sounds really good, uh, but then it's actually it's actually in practice not that great, uh, and that's why it's very hard to get people to to um, produce like interdisciplinary work. Uh, do, you, do you have anything to to say about that? So I'm I'm very positive myself about interdisciplinary work. I think it's easy to do it badly. You do it badly if you know person working in discipline A tries to write a paper that's interdisciplinary between disciplines A and B, but they don't really understand discipline B and neither do they really talk to anyone who does understand discipline B, then you get a lot of rubbish being written, unsurprisingly. But I think if you're willing to genuinely engage in the other discipline, by which I mean like really get under the skin of how people in that other discipline think and why, then there are some really intellectually interesting low-hanging fruit to be found there just because so few people have done this thing before Mm. and it's understandable why few people have done this thing before um, because firstly it's really quite hard you have to do that thing of getting under the skin of the other discipline that takes a lot of time and it involves developing a whole load of new skills um, which itself takes a lot of time Mm. and which you didn't come equipped with from your graduate studies or your undergraduate program or whatever And secondly, for whatever reason, it tends to be a bit less career prestigious because if you're doing, so let's say, you know, I'm employed by a philosophy department. I start doing some work that's interdisciplinary between philosophy and economics. How is this going to be viewed by my philosophy peers? Well, often it's viewed as, you know, well, this isn't real philosophy or, you know, we don't understand what you're saying and therefore we're not interested in it and we're not going to invite you to give seminars because we wouldn't understand what you said anyway. Or we're not in a position to judge how good this stuff is because we don't understand economics, so we don't understand your papers and therefore we're not going to give you points for having produced good stuff because we just don't know whether you're doing that thing or not. So there are, there are all these reasons why it's often less prestigious. So you have to be much more intrinsically motivated to do this thing rather than just chasing the career incentives to be willing to put in the quite considerable amount of time that it takes to do a good job of it. In terms of being able to recruit um, people who uh, already have kind of research going on, I guess like you guys decided to brand yourself as global priorities rather than effective altruism. Do you think it would be better maybe to have like more separation from effective altruism? Because effective altruism is kind of this like broader community. It's like potentially a group of quite young people. It's also like it's very, very applied, very kind of engaged in the world. And I wonder whether that is like not the most appealing to academics. And that's part of why I imagine you, you, it's the Global Priorities Institute rather than the Effective Altruism Institute. But perhaps um, it would be useful to just try to rebrand all of this as global prioritization um, as a kind of more palatable name and concept for people in academia. Oh, I was thinking that we already had. And the only reason I've been using the term effective altruism so much in this conversation <laughs> is because I'm talking to you. Right. OK, makes and sense. And I was thinking that your listeners will be thinking in those terms. But yeah, 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 when we're writing our, say, our research agenda or engaging in academics, we don't use the term effective altruism Okay. Uh, cool. for some of the reasons that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. All right. Uh, let's talk now about like what specific roles you guys are hiring for at the moment and um, what yeah people might do to prepare themselves for, for other similar roles in future. So, yeah, what, what positions do you, do you have open and yeah, who are you looking for? Okay, so if I'm answering literally the question of what roles we have open at the moment or will have open very soon, those roles are more on the operations and administrative side. Um, so we are currently in the process of replacing our operations director, who's unfortunately recently resigned, moved on to bigger and better things at ATK. <laughs> um, 
So that, just, yeah, just to explain that, that's that, that's Michelle Hutchinson who recently started as a coach at eighty thousand hours. So we've uh, we've poached her, but hopefully, hopefully we'll help to replace her as well. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so that that's the central role that we're actually hiring for over the next few months. Other things that we are interested in hiring for, but don't literally have the adverts out at the moment, um, are researcher positions. Um, potentially in philosophy, if we find the right person, um, but particularly in economics, because our current situation is that we have about four full-time researchers in philosophy and a much smaller and part-time team on the economic side. So what we'd really like to do over the next few years is achieve symmetry within the Global Priorities Institute between philosophy and economics. It's only for historical reasons, like the Institute having been founded by a bunch of philosophers, that we've got this initially skewed situation. We do want to be both genuinely interdisciplinary and genuinely to give at least as much weight to economics as we do to philosophy. So both on the philosophy and the economic side, but especially on the economic side, if there are people out there who are thinking they either are already researching the kind of topics that we're interested in, or they'd be interested in moving in that direction, then we're extremely interested in engaging with with those people, either as remote collaborators or with a view to possible hires in the future. So yeah, tell me more about the operations role that you're hiring for, kind of what that person would be working on and what sort of person would be really suitable to, to do that well. Yeah, I mean, operations roles tend to be a bit of a catch-all. Um, so this is maybe one one thing that follows from that is it's quite hard to answer your question. But another thing that follows from it is one thing people would want to be happy with if this kind of role is going to appeal to them is dealing with complexity. You often have quite a few complex balls in the air that you're juggling at the moment. So you need to be quite good at managing your own time, keeping track of quite a complex to-do list, prioritizing appropriately, being happy with doing a wide variety of things. So there can't be just one particular type of thing that you want to be doing day in, day out, week in, week out, because the job's going to involve quite a wide variety of stuff. Um, So that's one comment. Another comment will be the job's very well suited to people who understand the research. So they've got a strong background in the academic stuff but they've decided for whatever reason that they're not going to carry on aiming for a career in research, but they maybe like the research environment, they like working in that kind of atmosphere, and they're keen to support research activity. Um, Often the people who are strongest and happiest in ops roles fit roughly that kind of profile. The work often involves things like communicating the content of the research to other parties, especially non-academic parties. So if it's actually an academic conference, typically the person giving a presentation will be the person who actually did the research. But if it's something like a meeting to potential donors or an interview with the media or a talk at EA Global or that kind of thing, then it would often be an ops person giving that talk. So again, having that profile of not necessarily wanting to be the person doing the research, but enjoying the process of understanding and communicating the research, that's a very positive trait for somebody in an ops role. Um, And then in miscellaneous things, you might find yourself doing things like organizing the office, communicating with the administrative support staff who are dealing with budgets and that sort of thing, Um, having the strategic overview of the Institute's finances, thinking about whether we're going to need more funding coming from somewhere soon, and if so, where we might try to look for it, Mm -hmm. keeping tabs on office culture, noticing if people are unhappy, thinking about what we might do, that kind of thing. So this is the kind of spectrum of stuff that you might find yourself dealing with in an ops role. What do you think are the most uh, challenging aspects of the role? I mean, at the risk of repeating myself, I think one thing is the complexity of all the enormous number of sometimes small tasks that you find yourself dealing with, having to be constantly thinking about how to prioritize among this enormous number of things. Because there's always, I mean, I guess as, as in any job, but I think maybe particularly so in ops roles, there's always more useful things you potentially could do yeah. than like, you couldn't possibly do all of them. So you need to have the big picture in your mind of, which ones are more time urgent, which ones are more important that they get done at all and prioritize accordingly. Yeah, do you want to make the pitch for why um, operations seems to be just so important for academic research institutes and like what, what particular challenges you, you face uh, operations-wise? Sure. I mean, ops roles are absolutely crucial for the success of academic research institutes because without them, the people who are nominally hired to do the research in the research institutes end up having just about all of their time sucked up by other stuff. I mean, this is what happens to academics who aren't in research institutes, and I can speak um, from a position of authority on this, having previously been in that position. Um, The typical 
situation for academics is, uh, you know, research is the thing that you really want to do. Research is the thing that you're good at. Research is the thing that you are mostly nominally hired to do, but it's really hard to actually reserve any time for it because there's so much other stuff that you're also meant to be doing. And often that other stuff is stuff that you, the academic, are not actually particularly good at. So you're quite inefficient at doing it. And therefore it takes up far more of your time than um, it actually should do. Um, whereas if you've got a division of labour between the people who wanted to do the academic research and specialise in that on the one hand, and the people who wanted to do the ops work and specialise in that on the other hand, then you can have a lot more research happening. So the Research Institute can be vastly more productive in terms of actually generating the stuff it, it was supposed to do. Yeah, you're also running this um, a summer research visitors programme next year, right? That's correct. Yeah. So current um, current graduate students can apply to GPI to come and visit during roughly the months of May and June, Oxford summer term. Um, we've been having roughly 12 graduate students per summer um, come pretty much all at the same time as one another. So we end up with a kind of cast of thousands and quite a vibrant atmosphere, particularly for those two months and lay on a few sort of structured seminar series and so forth to help this cohort of graduate students develop their ideas about what GPI relevant research topics they might be excited about working on in the future and to get them started on those research projects under the supervision of the permanent or semi-permanent GPI academic staff. Yeah. Uh, when can people apply to that? Can, can they apply for it now? So the for the summer 2019 program, um, we've had two rounds of applications. The early round has already passed. That has filled all of the philosophy slots, but only half of the economic slots. So for economics graduate students, there's a second round of applications, if I remember correctly, in November. Um, okay. And they can apply to that for visiting in summer 2019. Um, for philosophy graduate students, maybe it's worth noting, we, we plan to continue this visitor program annually. So it's not just for 2019. So if they're interested in applying for some future round, they can apply in future or maybe send us an expression of interest in the meantime. And we'll make sure we keep them on the radar. OK, great. Yeah. Um, I expect that this will come out in October, so we'll stick up a link to, to the applications for, for any economics uh, people who want to who are interested in visiting G GPI next year. So you also mentioned a bunch of new scholarships that you're studying next year. Um, what are what are they about, and, and who should apply for them? Yeah, so we're, we're offering both scholarships and prizes. So the the prizes are for students who are already enrolled in a DPhil program at Oxford, um, and that provides top up funding in association with the student engaging with GPI and spending summers um, perhaps doing some GPI relevant research. Those scholarships are for people who are in the future applying for DPhils at Oxford and those will provide top-up funding to extend the duration of the student's funding package. So for example in philosophy uh, a situation that DPhil students often find themselves in is that they're only given two years of DPhil funding by the, say, the Arts and Humanities Research Council or whoever it is that, that gives them their DPhil funding. And that's really too short for the vast majority of people to provide a PhD. So rather than these people being in a situation of thinking, well, you know, I'd kind of like to go to Oxford in particular, maybe I'd kind of like to be able to engage with GPI, but Oxford's only offering me two years of funding and I've got an offer of five years of funding from such and such an American university. Yeah. Um, the Global Priorities Institute is seeking to top up in a way that extends the duration of the Oxford funding package. So you can come here with that same financial security that you would if you were going to a typical American program. Do you worry that with those scholarships, you, you might end up just funding a whole lot of people who would have done this this kind of thing anyway? Have you like kind of uh, tried to figure out like where you'll get the biggest bang for buck, you know, using money to try to draw people into these research questions? Yeah, um, of course, you know, we're <laughs> roughly thinking along EA lines. We always think about where we can get the most bang for our buck. Yeah, I think we we have experienced this as a, a genuine practical concern in the context of several of the extremely promising DPhil students that have been interested in engaging with GPI. And uh, since they're sensible people, they have been genuinely concerned by this asymmetry of funding where, you know, maybe they'd like to be at Oxford because they'd like to work with GPI and other organisations in the EA space that are largely localised in Oxford. Um, but they feel that that just wouldn't be sensible in financial or strategic terms for them when they're being offered so much more money and so much more security from, let's say, for the sake of argument, Princeton. Yeah. Um, so we've been developing this scholarship program precisely in response to these concerns that we've come across in practice in the context of more than one particular individual. 
And we think this is extremely high value because if we can get these very smart students more engaged in global prioritis, global priorities type research at this early stage of their career, there's a very high chance that they'll either, well, there's a much higher chance that they'll either develop a research career in the longer term that makes global priorities type questions a central part of it, or that they'll end up doing something else in the effect of altruist space. Whereas if they go overseas to some institution that has a much weaker EA presence, is I think, I mean, nothing in, nothing in this space is precisely measurable. We don't have an impact evaluation or an RCT or anything like that. But, you know, anecdotally and commonsensically, it's much more likely if that happens that they will end up getting sucked into or becoming interested in whatever's fashionable at the institution that they do go to. So we really want to encourage the best people who are at the moment interested in engaging with GPI to come here and do it. Yeah, okay. Well, for the for the thousands of listeners, no doubt, who are planning to start PhDs at Oxford, we'll stick up links to, to, to those scholarships. Uh, and uh, perhaps I'll add a pitch at the end once uh, about all of the kind of things that are on offer when it, whenever this episode actually actually goes out. Yeah, well, please do also stick up the links to the visitor program because that's one yeah. of our central mechanisms. Uh, we realize that, you know, of the extremely smart graduate students out there, an extremely small proportion of them are at Oxford. And we are yeah. also extremely interested in engaging with those who aren't at Oxford. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yes, please also include the links to the visitor <laughs> program and the other mechanisms by which um, people in those categories can come and engage with us. OK, so for people who are yet to do a PhD, but are thinking of doing one in future, if, if they have the option of working in potentially quite a lot of different fields or you know, trying to specialize in different fields, which do you think are the, are the, are the very most promising? And are there any particular subfields within those that you think are, have like particularly interesting research questions that would be relevant to GPI? I think philosophy and economics are the most obvious candidates. I mean, economics, I think, especially so if somebody's got the right skill set and the right kind of intellectual bent to both to want to go into economics and to succeed in economics, if they're interested in doing so, and then choosing their research topics in a way that's driven by EA type concerns, that's an extremely high value thing to do. And there's nowhere near enough people doing that kind of thing. I'm less well placed just because I'm a philosopher to try and answer the question about what subfield within economics is going to be the highest value. Um, so I think I'll try and avoid talking rubbish by not saying anything about that. I can answer the same question within philosophy. Mm. The central subfields of philosophy are moral philosophy and decision theory, relatedly formal epistemology. Those seem to be the ones that have really been key to the discussions that we've been having so far. If someone doesn't have a PhD, is there any value in, in them applying already? Or should they, should they go and get a PhD in economics or, or philosophy and then, and then come back to it in a few years? For... Full-time hires, we're looking at people who already have PhDs, but we do also have engagement mechanisms for people who are current or future graduate students, particularly in either philosophy or economics. Um, so one thing that we have advertised for existing graduate students, whether they're at Oxford or elsewhere, is a sort of support package where the Global Priorities Institute would provide a top-up for the student's existing funding package in return for that student engaging meaningfully with GPI while they're pursuing their doctoral research. So another thing is for people who are in the near future considering applying to graduate school in philosophy and economics, we have some scholarship programs where if the institution that they're applying to would provide, say, three years of funding, then they can apply to the Global Priorities Institute for a top-up package that would extend that to four or five years of funding, again, in return for engaging with, with GPI by, for example, visiting us in the summers during their um, during their doctoral studies. Are there any other uh, any other approach ways in? Like, possibly, would you be interested in hiring physicists or engineers or, I don't know, political scientists? Are there any other areas that people have a, have a chance in? Uh, yeah, I'm sure there are. I don't have a very good strategic picture at the moment of, you know, how might you attempt a rank ordering of disciplines in terms of things that are good to go into if you want to have a positive impact via something like a GPI-like strategy. I know a lot of people have been thinking about thinking along similar strategic lines in psychology. Um, so that's another another obvious one where there's some kind of proof of concept already existing. In the longer term, GPI does seek to broaden out to include other disciplines and work out which bits of other fields are particularly relevant here in the same way that we've been currently trying to work out which bits of, say, economics are relevant. So this is, this is a question that I've asked uh, a lot of people um, on, on, the, on the show at various different points, um, but it's kind of seems to divide people and it's hard to get, well, just, just asking one person isn't really enough. So 
when you're trying to decide kind of what PhD supervisor to take or what PhD topic to take or what to work on perhaps at a postdoc, but before you've really got, um, you know, tenure or job security within academia, how do you think people should trade off working on something that they think is really valuable and important versus something that's going to advance their career and make them likely to get a permanent position? Yeah, I think it depends on what their longer term game plan is. I think if you're dead set on the academic career path, then during the PhD, it's probably better to largely prioritize career prestige, maybe keep your fingers in some more directly impact motivated research pies at the same time. But I would advise those people against, say, doing something very applied, which is going to be seen by the academic discipline as not intellectually very demanding, that kind of thing. If their long term strategy is to have impact via first getting a respectable position in academia, then I think that would be my advice. There's a completely different category of people um, who also have a lot of value to contribute, which is people who are for the moment, like their, their next step is to do a PhD, but their long term plan is not to stay in academia. And I think for those people, the picture is very different. Yeah, what's okay. Yeah, how does it look for them? I think there's a much stronger case for those people to just disregard the academic career incentives because if you're not aiming for an academic career, those incentives are irrelevant anyway. Yeah. Um, and do stuff that interfaces much more with, say, industry or politics or give wells concerns or whatever. When you're hiring, how important is it that people are intrinsically motivated to answer these questions because they think they're morally important? I'm thinking like, could, could you could you just yeah pay people a whole lot of money to, to, to work on your research agenda, even if they don't think it's like especially important to them? Yeah, definitely. Um, in fact, I think we have at least one researcher, I won't go around naming names, <laughs> but I think we already have um, at least one researcher who approximately fits the profile you just mentioned. What's critical to us is that people are genuinely willing to make their decisions about what to work on based on importance. Uh, and imp importance by the lights of this sort of very impartial, perhaps long-termist kind of worldview, rather than slavishly following career incentives or just having a bee in their bonnet about some other thing and then just wanting any old academic position so that they can then carry on doing this other thing. Um, we don't want to be spending our money, obviously, on employing people like that who are not actually going to guide their research um, by GPI strategic lights. But as long as for whatever reason, perhaps merely that we're paying them, they're willing to genuinely guide their research by GPI lights. Um, if we're confident they're going to do that thing, um, then we don't really care what the motivations are. In practice, um, unsurprisingly, it does tend to be people who are intrinsically motivated who mostly fit this profile. But as I said, there are, there are already exceptions that we've come across and that we're quite happy with. So a lot of people are drawn to doing careers in global priorities research. I think people find it like quite an, quite an appealing uh, career prospect, which um, suggests I think that like quite a few of them aren't going to make it because there just aren't that many uh, positions. In fact, uh, I mean maybe it will increase in future, but I don't think it will increase in proportion to the amount of interest that there is. So, um, how might people be able to figure out whether they're likely to be able to get positions, like whether they're, whether they're really cut out to have a, have a career in in the field? And are there any kinds of people who should say, you know, although this is interesting to me, I should do something else because I'm just not likely to to get a job e either in academia or or outside of academia. I guess I'm trying to think like, are there any like clear signals you can get that you should just kind of give up that, that you should uh, like decide, oh, I'm actually not going to become a researcher. I should do something else. Yeah. So on various time scales, I think there are signals along those lines. So I know I know of several people who have decided against a research career, maybe partway through their PhD, because they find for one reason or another, they don't enjoy that kind of work. And they think, you know, trying to project that forwards they think they'd find it extremely difficult. Well, they both find it extremely difficult to stick at it to the extent that's required to succeed. And even if they could make themselves do it, they just wouldn't be happy doing that kind of work. Um, so, for example, one trait that often leads people to fit this profile is if people find that the thing they find motivating and satisfying is having a relatively quick turnover of projects that they're doing and then objectives achieved. Like if you want to be able to say, I've achieved my objective on a timescale of weeks rather than multiple months, then research is probably a bad field to be in because the timescale of significant progress in research tends to be more like a year than a week. You know, if you think of how long it takes from the genesis of an idea of a paper to getting anywhere near that paper submitted for publication, even in philosophy where like you don't have to do any experiments, so maybe compared to some other disciplines, the time scale is relatively quick. At least in my experience, it's typically on the order of a year, and some people can find that just very demoralizing. So, I mean, another thing that 
graduate students are very often concerned about is just quite aside from issues of their motivation and how much they enjoy this kind of work, whether they will be capable of producing research that's high enough quality to succeed in the field. I think that's a much harder one to judge at an early stage because in some sense, there's really no substitute for trying it and seeing what happens. A pretty bad idea is to consult your own feelings about how good you are at your subject. I say that's a bad idea because this often more tracks things like temperament and confidence. So you could you could be somebody who's temperamentally inclined to judge yourself quite negatively, but actually by the lights of everybody else, you're really good in your field, or indeed vice versa. Like there's a there's a lot of noise in that kind of signal. But if you can do things like solicit feedback from a significant number of mentors say you know people who are teaching your graduate seminars solicit feedback from them early on on how promising you seem to them as a potential future scholar or better still stick it out for the duration of a graduate program and try to get some things published in good journals during that time and just see whether you manage it Um, by that point you've got a pretty reliable signal of what your chances are of success in the field like at least in philosophy the very sort of academically best students have typically succeeded in either publishing or being within reaching distance of publishing something in one of the best handful of journals by the end of their PhD. So on that kind of time scale, you can get some kind of useful feedback about whether this looks like it's likely to work out in the longer term. Okay, let's move on to talking about money. Uh, yeah, does does GPR need need further donations? And, and what, what might you do if you, you know, if someone donated a, a couple of million pounds to you? I think the key thing we do over the next few years is we would we will be in a much stronger position to build up the economic side. We've got funds in our budget, obviously, to cover the hires that we've already made, but we don't have spare at the moment to make additional hires. And we do currently have this very skewed situation where we've got our philosophy research team. We've got we've got a respectable sized seed research team in philosophy, um, but nothing in economics. Now, the challenges in hiring economics are twofold. One is finding the well, maybe threefold. Um, So, you know, part one, finding the right people to hire. Part two, convincing that they want to come and work with us. But then we also need part three, having the money in the bank to pay them once we've done one and two. Mm. So as we hopefully get more and more successful with one and two, then we will crucially need three. Otherwise, it won't happen. Yeah, if I recall, Oxford requires you to have enough money to pay someone through the through the end of their contract in order to be able to hire them in the first place. Is that right? I think that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Which means that you kind of have to stockpile potentially quite a lot of reserves to to get moving. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have a signature on the dotted line. Yeah. From an EA focused donors perspective, what do you think is kind of the strongest argument for giving to GPI and perhaps the the biggest reservation that they, that they might have? I mean, I think the the strongest argument for giving to GPI is are going to be the arguments, uh, you know, the discussion that you have around the long term vision for GPI. So, you know, if you're sold on our view that it's going to be extremely valuable in the long run if EA ideas become both better represented within academia and it's the case that a higher proportion of the enormous amount of brain power that already exists within academia can be harnessed onto these extremely practically important and currently somewhat under-researched research questions. If you're sold on that vision, then that's also the case for funding it. I think the the other mindset you might have that would incline you against funding GPI might be something like, well, you know, we already pretty much know how these things go. Um, there are already lots of very smart people in the effective altruist community who've kind of worked out what the big picture is. And now the remaining interesting questions are just the sort of messy empirical ones like, well, which potential new technologies or actual new technologies pose the biggest extinction threats and what can we in practice do to mitigate them? Those kind of object level questions are not ones that you're going to get additional traction on by the kind of relatively intellectually tidy academic research that GPI specifically is engaged in. So if you think... You know, the big strategic picture, you know, we'd be, maybe we should be focusing on the long term. We, sh- we should be thinking about extinction threats. Um, we just want to work out which are the biggest object level risks and how to mitigate them. Then GPI is not the right institution for you to fund. I mean, I could tell you which one is, but <laughs> it's not us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, which which one would it be? I think the Future of Humanity Institute. I mean, I would say that because they're just across the hall from us. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but they're, they're the institute, at least, that I have the greatest familiarity with that is more kind of bypassing the traditional academic route. They're not really trying to place research articles in academically prestigious journals. They're not trying to write up the background theory for why you should care about this stuff. Um, they're just getting on with figuring out via whatever perhaps messy means are necessary what in practice we should do, and then reaching out directly to policy people, governments, corporations, and so forth, rather than going via the academic literature. Yeah. And I think that's also definitely a thing that's worth doing. It's just we've got this division of labor. So, yeah. you know, if you think that one of them and not the other is valuable, then fund the one you think is valuable. Personally, I think they're both extremely valuable. Yeah, that makes sense. So if someone was potentially interested in donating to Global Priorities Institute, who can they drop an email to? Uh, there is an email address on our website for that. I think it's contact at globalprioritiesinstitute.org. Okay, great. Let's talk just quickly a last question on careers. Um, I imagine that there's quite a lot of people who are interested in moving somewhat towards global priorities questions, um, you know, with a PhD or any further study that they might do, but they're not able for whatever reason to to, to come to Oxford, which would be, I guess, the natural choice if they if they were really keen to work at GPI. Is there anywhere a list of kind of academics or like relevant in research institutes that maybe not the maybe not the perfect place to study, but that that are like would take people in a, in a in a good direction towards related questions. And is that perhaps something that like a uh, eighty thousand hours should put together? Yeah, I don't know of such a list existing already. Um, we are very interested in supporting GPI type research done at other institutions. So if somebody's in that position, I definitely encourage them to get in touch, and we could see if we're in any position to help. Are there enough people doing related research uh, at other universities that it'll be worth putting together kind of a list of potential supervisors that people could work with? Or is it just too, is it just too niche? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's one of the things we're trying to figure out, I guess, to what extent are there people already doing stuff that's relevant to maybe GPI's research agenda for the sake of concreteness yeah. versus to what extent is this going to be a project of attracting more people to an academic subfield that really doesn't yet exist. I think the model we've been mostly working on is the second one, that there are things already being done that are kind of relevant, but there's not really anything like a an existing body of people directly focusing on research topics guided by the kind of the kind of vision that that we're working with. So you've got uh, the, the scholarships and the, the and the summer visitor program and this head of research operations uh, vacancy. Uh, when do you think you'll next advertise uh, an academic uh, position that people could apply to? Uh, that is a good question. It depends on a number of unknowns. One is fundraising, and another one is you know we advert we try to advertise positions when we feel reasonably confident that advertising positions would attract people who'd be a good fit. So I think maybe the thing I should say that is not directly answering your question but is relevant is. If somebody's asking that question, what they should do is contact us and register their interest. Because if we know there's somebody out there who would apply to a position if we advertised it, and we'd be interested in hiring that person, then we're much more likely to go to our fundraisers and say, look, we think there's a really good chance we could hire someone who's great and a really good fit. If only we had the funds, yeah. can you help us out here? Um, and then it's much more likely the position starts opening. If someone was considering working at GPI, what, what would you guess would often be kind of the second or third best options for them? Or what would be like nearby alternatives where they could have a really large impact? Um, well, one very nearby alternative is get an academic job anywhere. Once you've got tenure, you're free to work on whatever you like. You can work on GPI themes. You have to go through that process of getting tenure and maybe you have to jump through the career incentive hoops for a few years to get there. But if you're playing the long game, that's definitely a thing that you can do. Yeah. Um, the other obvious thing is you can do very similar kinds of research at EA type orgs that are not part of academia. So um, you could go and work for OpenPhil, for example. What do you find like most frustrating about academia and perhaps also what, what do you find uh, most appealing about it? Yeah, so I, I could answer that question with respect to the previous version of my job when I had a relatively standard ac academic job. Definitely the thing that was most frustrating was having a lot of my time taken up by dealing with meetings about things that I wasn't interested in and bureaucrat bureaucratic structures that didn't seem very valuable. You can feel like there's this burning thing that you want to do, but then 90% of your time is being sucked up by things that seem like rubbish. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm now in a very privileged position where I don't have that. But I mean, definitely as part of the standard academic profile, maybe more so in the UK than the US. So it depends somewhat on where you're planning on going. I think, yeah, the positives about working in academia, in my mind, fall into maybe two main categories. One is 
the job is just really, really intellectually interesting. So, you know, I've done a lot of jobs over the last, whatever, 24 years since I was 16 and started scanning things in the supermarket. And a lot of jobs, to a greater or lesser extent, are pretty mind-numbing. And you just really don't get that in academia. I mean, academics often moan about the fact they have to spend more of their time doing admin than they want to. But this is really like griping at the minor things that spoil the otherwise very perfect balloon. I mean, you do get to think about extremely interesting stuff and you actually get paid um, to spend time, you know, reading stuff that's been written by the world's best minds on your subject and talking to these people and thinking about it yourself. Um, And this would be just like if I had a job scanning things in the supermarket, you know, be the kind of thing I'd want to do in my evening, but I'd be too tired to do it. And I'm in the extremely privileged position of actually getting paid to do it. Mm. And that's just amazing. The the other thing I find very positive about working in academia is the flexibility, both in terms of work-life balance and in terms of being your own boss. I really feel I get to be like very self-directed to choose my own projects based on what I'm actually motivated to do. Whereas I think in just about, well, maybe not just about any, but in in the vast majority of other jobs, there'd be a lot more kind of frustration because somebody else or something else is telling you what to do and it's not the thing you want to do or you don't approve of the way you're being told to do it. Um, So I think you escape a lot of those very normal job frustrations to a very high degree by being in academia. Um, And also, you know, in if people are If people have a family or they're thinking of having a family, I think it's much easier to juggle that in academia, actually, than it is in the vast majority of other jobs, because you really do get to choose your own hours, both in terms of how many hours you work and in terms of which hours you work. Um, And I'm I'm now a parent of four children, and I found that extremely valuable for just being able to do all the things in my life that I want to do. Fantastic. My my guest today has been Hilary Graves. Uh, Thanks for coming on the show, Hilary. Thanks for having me. If you were into this episode, you might want to listen to Hillary's colleagues in episode 17, Professor Will McCaskill on moral uncertainty, utilitarianism, and how to avoid being a moral monster, and episode 16, Dr. Hutchinson on global priorities research and shaping the ideas of intellectuals. Also, just a reminder that, as I said at the beginning of the show, GPI is hiring for a head of research operations and looking for academic visitors, postdoctoral students, and summer research visitors. So if your work is close to theirs, or you want to move it in that direction, Don't be shy about going to their opportunities page on their website or getting in touch by emailing them directly. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you in a week or two.